Blog Talk Radio. Hello and welcome to Honey Badger Radio. This is your host, Allison Tiemann, and tonight's show is Silent Open Lines for New Year's Day. If you don't know what that means, that means you can call in and you can talk to us in the back room privately, or you can go on air if you want to have if you want to share something with the entire audience. The number to call in is one three four seven two one five eight seven four six. That's one three four seven two one five eight seven four six. And I have a uh, some other badgers on the line to come and talk to you uh, when you call in. I've got Hannah. Hannah, come on the line and say say a bit about yourself. Hey there, Hannah. Hi, um, I'm Hannah Wallen. I write the uh, blog Breaking the Glasses on uh, breakingtheglasses.blogspot.com and uh, also for the Honey Badger blog and Voice for Men and some other sites. Um, good to be on. Yeah, great to have you. And Rachel's in the house. Rachel, Rachel. Hi, can you hear me? <laughs> yes, we can hear you. Awesome. Hi, I'm Rachel Edwards. I write for the Honey Badger blog as well as my own blog entitled well, NaughtyNerdist.tumblr.com and uh, I read for the places <laughs> and stuff and things and I'm um, yeah, still here. You're, you're happy to be here? Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay, and Anna Cherry is with us tonight <laughs> as well. Anna, say hello. Hello, everyone. Um, and I guess uh, I'm a cosplayer and I also write for, I'm an adult entertainer and I write for um, Freddy Girl Problems uh, website as well as my own uh, MRA themed works on Medium, which is Anna underscore Cherry, as well as my Tumblr. Oh, and great. I'm Thanks. happy to be here. <laughs> happy to have you. <laughs> and we are also supposed to be having a Karen tonight, but she uh, she called in a little late, so she's somewhere in this uh, spaghetti's nest of, of callers. Uh, I will attempt to to ferret her out and bring her on, but it's going to take a moment to do that. Uh, Before we get into whatever will become of the show, because we have no topic, it's all free free balling, um, I just wanted to do a shout out to any patrons who are listening. Um, Thank you so much. You make this possible. Uh, without, Without your continued support, we couldn't do Honey Badger Radio, so give yourself a pat on the back if you're a Honey Badger patron. And uh, treat treat yourself to um, treat yourself to whatever you find treat treat like I guess. <laughs> so uh, without further ado, I guess I'll I'll give it over to my co-host to chatter amongst yourselves. I don't, I don't know what to throw out there uh, as, a, <laughs> as a as a as a as an initial topic. Um, hmm. Well, I, I, I think I know some. <laughs> I think I know what we could discuss. Like some maybe even the you know what what uh, this year has been. This past year, 2014, has has meant for things like a uh, you know men's rights activism and stuff, and maybe maybe a <laughs> maybe we could recall some of the greatest hits and some of the you know the good and the bad and the ugly. <laughs> sure. Um. What well, what what are your thoughts, Rachel? What 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 would you like to throw out there, as it were? Oh gosh. Oh uh, gosh. Let's let's go for the ugly. Because I think <laughs> I, I've never seen this before, and maybe it's because I'm, you know, uh, still a bit green, as it were. But I, I've never seen I've never seen the, the social justice types, you know, just so readily ride on the back of the dead. Like there were there was a situation with Elliot Roger and a lot of us, you know, we we got really down about what happened and people were trying to blame you know men's rights activists for for the deaths of these people and these well, uh, just you know, were if I could so add a little bit of something um I, I found out recently um which is not widely known that the two of uh, Elliot Roger victims were uh, women and uh, majority of them were actually uh, Asian Americans so it's more of a um, kind of almost a cover up of the actual tragedy that occurred that it wasn't aimed at women um, in a way in the fire just because that video surfaced of his you know ideology it, it has nothing no bearing on the actual victims only two of whom were women so it's an extreme minority and for them to hijack that uh, tragedy is extremely um, in bad form as you were saying 
Yeah, and, and we ahead. didn't Sorry. just see it. We didn't just see it with um, the situation with Elliot Roger. We saw it with you know some well-known people. We saw folks like Anita Sarkeesian, Jonathan McIntosh, um, Brianna Wu. These people so re- willing to ride on the back of a tragedy to push themselves forward. I think that the only, like right after someone has died in a situation, the only acceptable thing is to say, you know, our thoughts are with you or with this person and their family, uh, their families and, and and all of this in this, you know, this tough time. That's that's mm-hmm. the only respectable thing to to say in that situation. If you make it about anything else, right after someone's died, you're you're co-opting that moment of grief, that grieving period that you're supposed to give people, but it's just it's just been ridiculous. And I think Okay, that Rachel, Rachel, I'm I'm I have to uh I found the Karen. I found her Karen. Yeah, the Karen. Right. yeah, so we got we got a Karen in the house, so uh, I guess we have to say whatever is appropriate for someone who's come back to life and is no longer dead to us. So Yay. Uh, yay. Karen has risen. No, we're not talking about the good, the bad, am, and the ugly. I am so hungover. <laughs> I knew it. So unbelievably hungover. Like I, my mother-in-law came over. It was just, it was, just, we're just gonna have a nice New Year's Eve at home, you know, just us and my mother-in-law, and coming up first thirty in the morning, drinking Bailey's Irish cream, and and. I didn't even get out of bed till one this afternoon. Usually, I'm up by five in the morning. I didn't even get out of bed till one. And, yeah. You lazy bum. For, oh, for once, Karen was not gonna ask. I'm Karen Strawn, and I'm hungover. I don't even remember the name of my blog. I I don't even. I, there you go. That's, that's right now. Who wasn't? Who wasn't drinking last what last night? <laughs> so, I'm only calling you lazy because I took it upon myself to sleep till five. But my excuse is because I worked until nine o'clock this morning. So, oh, there you not go. the same. Well, honestly, uh, you know, it was it was actually nice because I actually slept more than eight hours, and I don't think I've done that in probably about two three months. Slept slept more. Than seven hours in a night. So like sleeping more than eight hours, that that just doesn't happen. So yeah. Yeah. But um but yeah, no, happy new year everybody. And uh Yay. I'm 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 indulging in a little bit of hair of the dog right now and uh and dinner's out of the way and, and all of that. So here I am. Um, oh, we were talking about Elliot Roger and, and all of that stuff, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, we were talking the about the good, the good, the bad, and, and the ugly, basically. The, yeah, the I got, of, I got of, a confession. This year? But, uh, of a, go on. But, but I just want I, I did want to add one thing to the Elliot Roger thing, right? Was mm-hmm. that if, you know, the, the criticism was that, you know, of feminist criticism uh, came down on anybody who said it was a mental health issue, it was making more mental health awareness level, because that was removing the perpetrator um, and blaming it on something else, which is mental illness, right? At the same time, they blamed it on masculinity um, and masculine and mas- cultural masculine norms, right? And and sort of uh, culturally. Uh, conditioned male entitlement and all of this other stuff, right? So they were removing blame from the perpetrator as well. They were just putting the blame on all men and the entirety of society rather than just on, you know, uh, mental illness that affects uh, very few people. I thought that was really interesting how they could complain about the one and then go ahead and do the other. It was quite hypocrisy. Wouldn't be the first time. (laughs) Anybody yeah. else got some some more of the? I, I do, I do. Oh, I got yeah, I, me too. Um, go ahead. I'll I'll say for last. Well, there, there's a couple things on the the Elliot Rogers thing, and and, and the the whole thing of co-opting. Um, if if there's a a cause like some sort of a cause, you know, that something terrible has happened, a terrible tragedy, eventually you got to address the cause. That's that's not. Um, well, well, yeah. That's not in question. But and, and at some point you do. But it's it's another thing to 
like yeah, people talked about and getting a conversation about mental illness was was a good thing, I think. Um getting that started, but it shouldn't have had to happen in response to people trying to make it about sexism when it wasn't. And that's where there's a big and as you see this with uh both sides of the gun control um discussion, you see this with discussions on sexism, you see it with discussions on all kinds of politics. Um it, it's just you got to co-opt any tragedy to make it about yourself. And and when you see someone like Anita Sarkeesian jumping on a shooting like minutes after it hits the news when it it hasn't even the event itself has not even finished happening um it it's disgusting and it is wrong and it is terrible um but it doesn't mean that we can't discuss those things at some point it's just not right to take away from people's ability to deal with the situation at hand on a human level before we start turning it into politics and trying to deconstruct it and decide what we can do to prevent it from happening again if we can. There we have to have it we have to deal with it as human beings, not politicians. And and uh, the other aspect of this is and I said this in my, my recent interview, um it if you call the tail a leg that doesn't make it a leg. And if you straw man men's rights advocacy and then try to uh, superimpose it over another person's life to make that person a men's rights advocate in order to delegitimize men's issues, that doesn't delegitimize men's issues. It doesn't make the guy a men's rights advocate. It simply shows that you don't have a legitimate argument against men's rights advocacy and you have to go to extreme measures and make shit up in order to attack us. And that's pretty much what uh, feminists everywhere have done every time there has been a tragedy of, of any proportions, even you know if it's if it's uh, an unrelated uh, unrelated violent act that only involves a few people and nobody dies, they'll still try to put it on us, even if there is no discussion of gender going on at all in the act. If it's a conflict between a man and a woman or a boy and a girl, they'll still try to put it on us. So it's that this is something that we're just going to end up facing until they get it through their heads and it doesn't shut us up. Mhm. Okay. Well, I do have a guest that wants to come on and talk to us, so I'm going to pull on pull Max onto the floor. Max, are you there? Yes. Hi. How's it going, everybody? Oh, it's going well. Hello. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, what did you what did you want to talk about tonight, Max? Uh. Well, just very quickly, I just wanted to say uh, thanks for doing this, and uh, also it's a privilege to be able to talk to everyone, especially uh, uh, hungover Karen. That's sort of a, a cherry on the top. I'm just, I'm just playing. But, oh yeah, uh, no, I'm not very nice when I'm hungover. I just have to let you know that. And, no, uh, I know. That's why I was excited. As it's like that. That's why I'm telling you right now. Fuck you, and fuck the horse you rode in on, <laughs> <laughs> or something like that. Okay. Uh, okay. No, no, thank you. Um, yeah, I tried um call well, I called in last week to speak to Allison off air and uh I'm just unfortunately due to technical difficulties, uh I wasn't able to get my question uh across uh, effectively. So, I just fi wanted to ask um with every one of you uh being involved with the men's rights movement for so long. I was just curious as to how prevalent you see uh, people come to you and explain their problems as being related back to uh, stuff like autism, because I'm autistic, and I find that in regards to my relation, not my relationships, but just the way that I relate with other people, especially because I go to university, I meet a lot of feminists and stuff like that. How often that is a, a, a trend or a, just the genu general occurrence uh, in your travels and your general workings? Um, are, are you asking if uh, some of the some of the problems that men face um, that that some of it has to do with uh, not being able to relate? because of autism? Yeah, uh because generally, they're suffering yeah. autism. Well, I think just how how often do you come across that? Well, I think I think actually one one of the problems 
that people with autism face is that is that they they really are um, they, they are sort of direct communicators. Uh, they don't you know they don't really engage in a whole lot of if you pass the if you would pass the guacamole that would be awesome kind of language. Um, and direct communications can make people very uncomfortable um, because it it sort of uh, it implies a familiarity uh, that maybe or a relationship type that maybe doesn't exist um, to to people who are not on the autism spectrum. So I think that, that there's there's a huge amount of uh, of problems as far as uh, them being taken the wrong way. Um, them being taken as being overly harsh or not being capable of human feeling and things like that. And I, I actually think that uh, people on the autism spectrum are not incapable of empathy, like of compassion, right? They're not incapable of compassion. They they just have a hard time with social interaction and uh, and maybe with figuring out how through nonverbal cues and all of the subtle social cues how a person, given person, is feeling at the moment. Um, and why, right? So, but that doesn't mean they don't care about how they're feeling. They just can't figure it out. So, I think that those those kinds of uh, of problems. Um, but one one of the interesting things about uh, people on the autism spectrum is is they can actually, um, you know, it, it's sort of uh, there's a lot of bullshit that goes on with social interactions and and. People on the autism spectrum don't really do that, and uh, so you can sort of expect uh, perfect honesty. In some Karen, what are but you doing? Not doing anything. Really? Because You're not like here. I'm, it's, it sounds like somebody is anyone? rolling up aluminum foil in the background or something. Either that Sound like or a whole destroyed. bunch of plates just crashed. Yeah, just yeah, no, a whole bunch I'm, of plates. I'm not. I'm not doing anything. I'm. It's just totally quiet here. Okay. So, so who is the who is the secret like plate destroyer? Wrapper or whatever. Oh, yeah. It's, it's not me. I'm just sitting here. I oh no! Yeah, I'm definitely not, not me. Yeah. Well, let's 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 let's, let's do the mute test. <laughs> okay. I, I think it's Anna. I'm sorry, Anna. All right. C- continue. Uh, I apologize for interrupting you, Karen, but it sounded like no, uh, no, no. That's, that's really, World I mean, War three with plates as weapons. But, but like honestly, those those ways that that, that are more typical for interaction of you know with people on the autism spectrum that that they can really get people's backs up. Um, you know, just coming out and saying something, right? Even if it's something that everybody knows, but it's just not something you would talk about, right? Um, you know, for politeness or to to not make people uncomfortable and all of that, right? Um, you know, that that can cause a lot of a lot of issues um, just with people thinking that they're they have bad intentions or or they uh, they don't care about other people or or whatever, right? And so I just I think it's it's really a bad rap that they get because I think on basically I think that they're probably the most honest people out there. Um, because they're sort of not as capable of those sort of social deceptions and and the sort of roundabout ways of of saying things and the you know say the subtle implications um, subtly implying something without coming out and saying it no they just say it right mm-hmm. so um, you know they of course they have a huge amount of of problems and and uh, a lot of MRAs get blasted for being autistic and. Or you know gamers or whatever for being autistic and just not knowing how to behave. They just don't don't know how to behave and and it's it's really sad to see that because there's a lot of value in you know mm. in speaking what you think um, without really even being necessarily aware, let alone fearful of the social implications of that. So. Anybody else? Uh, I do. I do get questions about that um, every now and then on my Tumblr, but I'm not as familiar with it as as, as some would be. 
Yeah. Well, you know, um, just from from my little experience with it, it seems like a um, a condition that social justice warriors in general feel entitled to ignore um, as a as a handicap and treat as a uh, a thing they can use as a slur. I, yeah, I no, have been yeah, it's something yeah. that I for for um saying something blunt or saying something they don't want to hear um a, expressing a truth they don't want to face or a, expressing something they don't want to acknowledge but they don't want to argue with I get called autistic all the time like it's a you know like that's derogatory or or something um and it's it's kind of a ridiculous thing because if there was if it was a, a condition that was more common to to women than it is to men, they would be outraged at that. But because oh, it yeah, is no, more I common have... to men and it's more noticed in men, it's it seems like it's suddenly okay for them to use it as a slur. Well, look at look at it this way: like psychosis spectrum disorders, otherwise known as personality disorders, are more common in women than in men and I have made the comment that I would really love it if some brave research er, researcher out there um, took it upon himself to uh, maybe if he has tenure and and wins the lottery and doesn't need to get funding for it from someone uh, took it upon himself to see what percentage of of very hardcore feminists have personality disorders because I think that the the ratio would be close to you know one to one yeah. um, as far as just if you look at the symptoms of personality disorder and sort of the delusions of conspiracy, the delusions of persecution, the delusions of erotomania combined with delusions of persecution, which is essentially the chronic fear of rape um, and obsession with rape and, and all of that, you know, all erotomania, all of these men want to fuck me and persecution and it harms me that they all want to fuck me, right? And so, I mean, like, you, you just, you look at all of these parallels between the symptoms of personality disorder and not not just the behavior of feminists, but their theories and, and their hypotheses and their, their theoretical framework, right? And, and I have been called a misogynist for suggesting that maybe feminism is just a manifestation of personality disorder, Right. Um, at least theoretical feminism, academic and scholarly feminism, is is a manifestation of personality disorder. And so, and and I'm not even saying that in kind of the judgmental way of you know, therefore these people are horrible people, right? It, it's it's more like why are we trusting them to sort of dictate public policy? Why are we trusting them to change legislation when it's it so much of it seems to be based on delusion, right? And uh, and so much of it seems to be based on the over-interpretation of intention where it doesn't exist or the uh, the uh, assumption of intentionality uh, where it absolutely can't exist, right? Like, I mean, like that they, they see, they over-interpret people's intentions. They over-interpret, like, patriarchy isn't just how things worked because it was the easiest way f to make things work uh, for both men and women. No, it was a conspiracy of men to, to keep women support subordinated for men's benefit, and those things, right? Um, th this is, I mean, it, it's, it's highly dubious thinking, um, and, and it assumes, essentially, that, that all men were participating in a conspiracy against women, um, you know, wittingly or unwittingly, um, but that, that there was a conspiracy there to keep women subordinated. Mm -hmm. And you see this in all the second wave feminist rhetoric about, you know, uh, rape is no more or less than the means by which all men keep all women in a state of fear. And uh, I think it was Catherine McKinnon who said that rape and sexual violence on the part of men was part of a concerted campaign to subjugate women. Um, like, all of these things. Like, how on earth were these women taken seriously and not put, put in a fucking not home? Laughed, not laughed off, off the stage. Yeah, it is pretty incredible. But uh, I wanted to ask Max, did you have an yep. additional question for us? Um, kind of. I, I just wanted to get, like, I'm very glad that Karen, uh, with her experiences in regards to 
um, autism and recognizing it and people that she's talked to are just researching it, that um, there is a difference between um, these two types of autism. One is high-functioning autism, and those are the type of people that typically don't enjoy the uh, company of other people. And Asperger's, which is what I have, that actually um, are very much capable of compassion and desire human contact. And um, because it, like because of uh, my autism diagnosis, um, the main reason why I called in today is because I have a sort of um, uh, just this personal crisis in regards to um, just the whole concept of MGTOW and going your own way. Um, because what I find is that despite my best attempts to try to appeal to other people, not come across as annoying or too direct or stuff like that, it doesn't really work despite the best attempts to uh, develop my character. But the problem is, well, with MGTOW, um, one of the main tenets of it that I see among people online that I'm sure you're familiar with, like Sam Mann and Barbosa and people like that, is that they have this general distrust of women. And because of that, it, it sort of makes me very apprehensive of the whole concept. Because, like, I, I listen to you guys, and you guys are very compassionate people, and you very much know what you're talking about. And because of that, it, it sort of makes me feel like I... Um, and not going to be good enough in terms of uh, ever a attracting a mate, for example. Like you know, you said oh. to call in because. Do you mind if I just feeling... just? Do you mind if I explore that a little bit more? So listening to us makes you feel like you'll never be able to attract a mate. No, 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 no. Not at all. What I'm, I'm just... saying is no. Uh, what I'm saying is um, like that. The rhetoric that I hear coming out of MGTOW is that. Um, women have like a general nature where they're uh there's this like toxic hypergamy or something like that and i know that's not true because i listen to the, like people like you guys talk and just from the way that you speak and the compassion that you share about these issues i know that's just not true but because of my just my afflictions and stuff like that it makes me feel like i have to like it's mandatory that i had to be in MGTOW because there's no possible way that i will ever um have a partner for life or be married or stuff like that. Well, Don't I, let okay. people define you that way. Don't let people make you feel like you have to be a certain thing or be a certain way or or uh, believe a certain thing about everybody. Um, what what MGTOW talk about isn't necessarily false. It's there and, and it's also not necessarily true as in being able to generalize it to all women or or that it's nature rather than nurture. Um, this is something that, it, it, it's going to be a thing of observation. Just like you would for a man, you simply have to be able to judge women on the basis of their character and the character they display. And you really can use the same criteria you would uh, for, for trusting a woman as you would for trusting a man. If a woman exhibits a behavior that would cause you to not trust a man if he did it, uh, being a woman shouldn't make you ignore that. You know, that's yeah. that's something that you know, we we don't really teach guys that as they're growing up. And uh, it, it's not. I, I I'm not going to call uh, men going their own way wrong, because I I do understand why they end up in that position. I know, having seen some guys go through some just absolutely hellacious experiences. Um, but yeah. it does not necessarily mean any more that it is, uh, that it should make things impossible for you uh, than it would that it should make things impossible for a woman because some men are assholes. Yeah, well, I mean, like, the the one thing that, that MGTOW does draw attention to that I really like, and I mean, like, because I... I do have a problem with the whole idea of toxic hypergamy as, like, sort of that hypergamy is toxic. I don't think it is. I think it's just an is. It has, there's very, you know, uh, sound and logical reasons why it exists in women. Um, it's it's really just, it's just something that that is there, and I don't, I don't see it as toxic. It can become toxic if it's taken to an extreme, like uh, Kobe Bryant's ex-wife taking him for, you know, or or uh, what's the golfer um, Tiger Woods, his wife, you know, she's she's got a quarter of a billion dollars from the divorce settlement, right? Mm. And uh, and never really did anything to earn it. 
Um, so, so you just you have you have that aspect of it. It can it can and, and the culture en- enables that. Um, the the culture justifies it. That that's really what uh, I think men need to be looking out for. It's not the fact that a woman will screw you over. It's that the state and the family court and the legal system and the criminal system and everybody else will hold you down while she screws you over, right? Um, that that's really what uh, what men need to be wary of, and and it's why these men are so distrustful of women. Is not so much that women are any less trustworthy than men, but that when they breach that trust, when they betray you, the system will essentially hold you down and help them rape you, right? <laughs> like that. That's really what it is. So. Given the environment and given what women can do if they choose to, right, with the assistance, the full connivance and and the enabling of all of these systems um, and institutions, you kind of do have to say to yourself, this woman has to be more trustworthy than any average, any given guy that I would be interacting with because... That guy would not have all of this muscle standing behind him if he decides to breach my trust. Yeah, right. Exactly. But uh, I wanted to. Oh. I'm getting sort of a sense, uh, Max. Do, do you have any questions about how to um, be appealing to women, or was that not? Uh, am I totally out of left field on that one? Um, sort of. I, I just want to say, like, one very quick five-second thing is that, like, in regards to, like, divorce court and stuff like that, I totally support MGTOW on that. It's, like, it's a terrible, terrible thing. I've seen people go through that. But, yeah, it's just, yeah. like, being autistic and um, just, like, constantly being told that the reason why you're not having luck in terms of gaining a partnership or uh, compassion from the opposite sex is because you're doing something fundamentally wrong and you have to figure out what it is and you can change it. And it's this sort of vicious cycle of trying to figure out what that is, um, it, it, it's very, very uh, demeaning to myself and discouraging, and it's almost like I don't feel that there's a way out, even though I desperately want to have a family, get married one day, and uh, I don't know, if, like, because I, I, you guys are my religion, <laughs> and uh, I just <laughs> oh wanted to see if you guys um, had any perspective on that. Um, I think... I really like. I, I really don't know if I can give you any answers. I think this is something that men really need to help each other with. Um, I would point you to the the problem with the game community is is there's so much toxicity and and it, and just it nonsense. But uh, if you could maybe find uh, um, people who are individuals who are working on uh, on not just uh, not just romance but also social skills. Um, I think that might help. Um, I I know there's a forum that I sort of uh, was was following for a bit. It's called No More N- Mr. Nice Guy. I think that's a no more general Mr. social. Mr. Nice Guy. No more Mr. Okay. Nice Guy. Okay. Um, that might be something to look into. Um, uh, maybe you can look into the uh, the the people involved in pickup artistry who talk about inner game and stuff like that. They might have something that's long- helpful. Yeah. Yeah, if I were to, could I could I say something? Sure, go ahead, Rachel. No, well, no, you can say nothing, nothing. But ah, <laughs> well, you know, the thing about it is, is you know, first off, on on the MGTOW thing, you know, you don't have to do anything that you don't want to. But I can understand, you know, why people do that. I I honestly see that a lot of times when with the same kinds of behaviors, with the little things that I would consider to be a negative, while there are a lot of positives about it, um, are things that usually see with people who just realize that they have been lied to for a good portion of their lives. So they are, you know, very upset and and very distrustful. But I think when a lot of time passes, they sort of just mellow out. They find, you know, a, a good balance of what is rational and what is irrational. But but in terms of, you know, finding someone, I think the the best thing, the best course of action is probably just to you know, do do what you love. Do, do what you love to do. Enter the communities where you feel comfortable and just, you know, put yourself out. And if nothing happens, you, you've still found yourself doing something that you love anyway. So it's kind of a win-win. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, go, going off of that, um, I actually get a tremendous amount of uh, questions via Tumblr that um, have to do with a lot of that, that uh, I'm not 100% certain if they are coming from artistic spectrum diagnosed men, but it definitely has a air of, hey, I'm so many years, you know, 20s, whatever, um, I've never even kissed a girl, I don't know how to really attract girls, what do I do? So... Um, Going off of the doing what you love, definitely um, 100% on that. But the pickup community, something has to be said for inner game and the pickup community. It, they, it does work. They can't teach you ways to pick up those superficial, sexy blondes, et cetera, et cetera. But they will not give you a lasting relationship. And from what I understand about autistic spectrum, which I am as well, um, I, I believe I have Asperger's, is not um, diagnosed 100%, but coming from a neuropsychology perspective myself, it's like a self-diagnosis, um, but uh, I definitely understand where you're coming from and the knowledge that you can't really relate to normies out there, the neurotypicals, that um, they, they find you awkward in different ways, and that can be really, really difficult. And um, finding a partner for life amongst people who don't fundamentally gate you it seems like a daunting task, but the thing is, um, there are autistic girls out there. There are people like us and like, um, not necessarily Karen or, or Hannah, but people who are mistaken for being autistic or whatnot because we, we are not neurotypical. We're not like typical females in the sense of buying into the same ideas and mentalities. And there are groups of us out there like at, um, you know, like sci-fi conventions and places like that. So that's usually my go-to advice. If you want to feel confident about yourself, yeah, go for a PUA, pick up a few girls, do that, but that's not going to give you a lasting relationship, which in my experience, that's what is most uh, searched for by autistic people. So, I think, I, I think though, that that uh, a few sexual, uh, even just short-term sexual... Oh, yes. Oh, it's wonderful. ...can really confidence per- boost somebody's confidence Absolutely. in their ability to attract the but, audience. That's why I do advocate uh, a minimal, so to speak, exposure to the PUA community in the sense of gaining some insight into uh, how and what attracts typical females. Mm -hmm. Okay, before we continue, uh, we we do need to bring on another caller. I want to thank Max for coming on and uh, voicing, um, well, his own piece and uh, and bringing it to us so we could discuss it. So thank you, Max. Um, right, and if, if if we are able to have another call in show, please do call in again. Um, okay. I'm sorry. Can I just? Uh, s- sorry, what were you going to say, Max? Sorry, I was just going to say one very last thing. I, like I know it's Rachel, Hannah, Karen, and Allison, but who was the fifth lady that I was just talking to? That Anna that Cherry. Uh, Anna Cherry. Yeah, I'm kind yeah. of a guest cosplayer slash adult entertainer person. Well, you you've been on a few shows, so I get mm-hmm. you're you're a, you're a special host. Woo-hoo. Okay. So, thanks again for calling, Max. Um, okay. And we, and we are going to move to Jay. Hi, am I on? Yes, you are. You're on. Hello. Oh, okay. Um, actually, uh, I'd like to finish um, the last caller spot, and uh, basically, it seems like the best POA instructors do this Babylon Five thing, where they move beyond the veil and they're never seen from again. And it's like, oh, that was a great instructor. He was very spiritual. He was a very good person. And you never see from him again. I think PUA is kind of like a larval stage that people go through. <laughs> Anyways, to my question, yeah. I mean, basically, that's that's my experience. Like, they, they get married out or they say, I'm better than this. I mean, it seems like Tucker Max <laughs> went through that entire thing, you know. If you look at his thing, it's like, oh, yeah, I want to settle down. What? You know. Anyways, <laughs> you can... Yeah, you can like probably talk about that about later, but um, I have more of an interesting intellectual question or a discussion point. Um, in a lot of history, it is the young wealthy that have supported um, new art movements, and how this ties to feminism is that now that we have the internet, a lot of them are trying to portray themselves as artists, and they don't have the talent, and I don't see that that happening and that's one of the cultural issues that's happening with um, Gamergate and it ties into the fact that feminism as an ideology seems to be two pronged it seems to be benefits for um, the elites you know and it seems to be a control uh, for um, you know us plebes you know or, or us uh, uh, 
a proletariat. Anyways, I was just wondering if you could discuss that. I mean, that's what it seems discuss to be. Discuss feminist art, basically? Well, <laughs> yeah, it's all, well, it's all men's Vaginal knitting. Vaginal knitting. Yes. Vaginal knitting, well, for yeah, one thing. Talking. Okay, well, guys, guys, yeah. I can, I can sum up... I can sum up I can sum up feminist art it's it's all basically I'm female that's it that's all it's just, it's all it's it's, uh, it's entirely about the fact that they're female and nothing else like they have no personhood outside of being female that's why they don't need any skills their entire skill is just you know being female I am being female and that's that's the sum total of all my ability and Possibly. Their bonus points if they can reduce it to just the vagina. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, 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 you're right. There is no skill. But the reality is the reason why there is no skill is because when you are an artist and you're not reducing yourself down to being female, you you have to actually look at your actions and say, well, I, you know, I'm going to have to gain skill. Therefore, I have to methodically learn uh, how to do stuff like draw or or sculpt or use programming to create interactive exhibits something right you have to you have to actually see yourself as a person who takes action to change the world and if you're reducing yourself down to a slab of meat um, and putting yourself on display as an art object or putting some aspect of your femaleness on on display as as art which which really relies entirely on our society's making femaleness so fucking special so, so it's, a, it's such a specialness that just being female is special and and if you if you if you fall back on that of course you're not going to develop any skill and you're you're just going to suck and you're, you're going to suck so bad that you just you, you redefine the word suck um it just you know it's it, that the two things go together <laughs> I don't know if well, I answered you, your question or just ran well, it. you know, when you when you look at, at uh, what's happened to art, you know, we had several different movements, and then people were starting to were trying to figure out, okay, how much can we bring, can we minimalize this before people know, realize that we're bullshitting them? That's that's really what <laughs> art, modern art has come down to. It's I am going to have a more involved explanation then I am going to put work into this. And yeah, well, I mean, look at people who do the intricate stuff, look and at, they get almost no money. They're, like, doing whole, like, advanced things for, like, 20 bucks on DeviantArt. Well, look at, <laughs> look at it this way. You, you have Steven Pinker who says that one of, the, one of the, the movements that came out of sort of the blank slate theory of human nature, that there is no human nature, we are all born blank slates, and therefore, there are no human universals, right? No natural, innate human universals. So uh, one of the things that came out of that was a movement for art that se- separated it from the concept of beauty because beauty could no longer be described as a human universal, something that, that you know people generally agree on across cultures that these things are beautiful and these things are not. And if you know anything about how people across cultures react to brown hairy spiders or snakes or, you know, and how they react to uh, baby animals, um, you know, that are that have the big eyes and then the really, they're really cuddly looking, right? You know that humans have sort of an innate uh, sense of what is attractive and what is not, right? What is, what is visually pleasing and, and what is visually... Uh, repulsive to them, right? So this this it's movement basically what is worth what is worth preserving and what is not by a genetic you know, this movement of art or what's to be avoided and what you should go and yeah. touch what you shouldn't right? And this movement of art was it basically tried to separate uh, art from the idea of beauty and and one of the most interesting things about it was it became extremely elitist in the sense that if the masses liked something because they found it, uh, if, if the majority of people liked something because they found it aesthetically pleasing, then it was bourgeois, it was, it was, it was just, it was for plebs, right? It was, it was, it was just garbage, right? It was only this sort of highbrow, really ugly, um, completely pointless pile of sugar packets um, 
that somebody was selling in an art gallery for like fucking, you know, a hundred thousand dollars. That's art, right? A pile of sugar packets, right? Um, it, it just it became completely ridiculous, and and it wasn't that it's it's the statement behind the art, right? It's it's what the art is trying to tell you about the human condition, which is sugar packets, I guess. But you know, like the, it it just it just really it really has been um, it's been an interesting century as far as all of that kind of thing goes. And a lot of it has to do with with this need, uh, this desire on the part of people to um, to see human beings as having no intrinsic or inherent nature, and uh, and therefore be completely malleable and uh, and completely uh, sort of moldable in every which way that you can imagine. So yeah. Well, well, I wanted to thank uh, thank Jay for that provocative question, and let's move on to Ren. Oh, wait, wait, wait! Before we do that, um, I'm gonna just step back to the Elliot Roger uh, topic, and I want to recommend to everybody because I was searching for it earlier a blog post on MindHacks.com, M-I-N-D-H-A-C-K-S.com, called "This Complex and Tragic Events." supports my own view and it is absolutely the most beautiful uh blog post about the tendency of people to use tragedies to push their agendas it's it's, it's wonderful and i recommend everybody read it right. thank you for that karen rendell did i get your name right oh hi time? guys hi yeah so you had a you so question much. about about feminism and uh games video games so why don't you take that uh, away? Well, before I start with that, I just want to say um, Happy New Year to everyone, though, and thank you so much for having me back on again. Thank you. Oh, you're, you're welcome. welcome. Happy New yeah. Year. Happy New Year. Yeah, the, let's hope uh, this one is going to be a better one than last year with games, at least. Um, which brings me to my question. I was just wondering, how much sway do you guys think that feminism is going to have with games this year? I'm a little bit worried because last year it just seems like they constantly just kept bombarding games with just talks of misogyny, 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 you know. And well, it kind of drove me a little bit crazy. Well, I don't know if they're going to have as much as much sway, as le- at least in terms a noticeable sway, uh, for for a long time. They it's going to still going to take a long time because right now, even though they're having a lot of uh, luxury awards, like giving an award to a, an award to Nina Sarkeesian for being a, an ambassador or whatever. I mean, that's that's just a political statement for right now. Right now, it's just a political statement. Right now, it's just theory that they're trying to push, which is of course bullshit. Um, right now, I think we still have an opportunity to to change things. I mean, if these guys really had the kind of power that a lot of us think they do, they would have been able to successfully get rid of hatred. They would have been able to successfully pull hatred, and right now they don't. Because when yeah, it comes well, down I, to it, it's, it's, oh, here, here's it's not going to make money. Because there's mm-hmm. there's a uh, there there's a significant event that happened just like a month ago. Uh, that may actually be able to at least uh, stymie uh, feminist sort of insurrections and, and entryism into a lot of different places, and that is the unraveling of the University of Virginia Rolling Stone gang rape story. Um, so, because you have people like Anita Sarkeesian, you know, standing in front of a gigantic screen that says "Listen and Believe," right, and then you have this unbelievable story that was printed in Rolling Stone that turned out to be likely, entirely likely, completely fabricated, right, on the part of the person telling it, uh, the person saying it happened to them. And so, you know, listen to women, listen to women when they talk about their experiences of oppression and blah, 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 and, and violence and all of this other stuff, right, and misogyny, right? Well, Rolling Stone listened and believed this woman, and she sold them a line of freaking hooey 
that none of it, not a single aspect of it, may be true in any way whatsoever, right? And so people are starting to realize that maybe feminism is lying. Um, there, there was a huge amount of backlash against uh, the sort of the rape culture zealots in in the mainstream media. Even uh, Time Magazine wrote an article that was, you know, that basically was critical of of the statistics that have been promulgated since essentially since the 1980s, 1990s about rape on college campuses and things like that by feminists, right? And so, I mean, you have this situation where people are starting, like all over, are starting to say, wait a minute, it sounds to me like you guys are selling us a line of bullshit. And so I think that it may well be that uh, that because this is happening now, right, when when the inroads are being made into the gaming community, um, you guys might have an easier time. Um, you already have an easier time just due to the nature of gaming and gamers, as gaming as an industry and gamers as a demographic, an easier time uh, preventing the, the hostile takeover from happening. But uh, but this may actually work in your benefit as well, right? So. I think there's yeah. also another aspect to this. Um, this this is kind of a good litmus test for which uh, which organizations or which uh, companies or which publications and things like that sort of belong to the uh, political establishment. The, the what is out there in power right now um, versus what doesn't, because you'll see uh, questioning. You'll see a legitimate questioning. Real, honest to goodness. Hey, this is hold this on is one second, guys. Um, is listen. that echoing on my end or yours? I hear this echoing for some reason, and uh -oh. it sounds like um. There's a little bit of of choppiness. Oh, yeah, okay. I'm not hearing it's, echoing. It's blog talk radio. We can't do anything about it. It just oh it's no, no, no no. I was just wondering. Yeah, I'm sorry. I was just wondering if it was um if it was my phone or if it was um my system or anything I was using. Don't worry about well, it. Well, it um, might be it. It might be that somebody is not muted that needs to be muted. Unfortunately, uh, it might be your phone. Let me just, uh, I will try muting you. Did you have anything more to, to add to that at all, Rendell? Um, yeah, no, I was just going to say, uh, yeah, it's with these feminism, though, sometimes I kind of wonder if there's, a, if there's a line that they cross with them in their mind, at least mentally, if they cross that line from just making up these stories to just flat out believing them, like they're starting to become paranoid or schizophrenic. Uh, okay. Because I believe yeah. a lot of these feminists, because I believe a lot of these feminists are just like starting to believe their own bull and really are, at least in their mind, someone's imaginatively raping them or whatever. Okay. Well, I well, think I, I just before we, before we continue, we do have to move on to to further callers. So I want to thank Rendell for calling. And for bringing up the points he did, uh, I'll let you guys respond, um, and uh, then we have to move on to the next caller. Thank you, Rendell. Okay. I was going to say, when it comes to that, it, it depends on which aspect of feminism you're talking about, because there's there's difference. There's a, a huge difference between the the higher up, you know, the 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 leadership of feminism, and and the grassroots of feminism. Um, and I think a lot of times the grassroots of feminists and feminism don't that they don't have a clue. They don't actually realize what they're being used for, and they do believe the rhetoric, um, but but their belief is only skin deep, and they're it, it's mainly emotion based, and they defend it with emotional outbursts. So they're not going to change their minds simply because um, they're not going to listen to facts. Whereas you get up into the uh, the the higher end of feminism, I think a lot of it is uh, politically motivated, and they're simply using uh, gender gender issues as a platform for a, a completely different uh, political outlook and, and political push. So it, it's not that they have started to believe it, it's that they find it extremely useful and they find their grassroots to be useful idiots who they can manipulate into promoting this shit. Um, but, but back to the whole media thing, um, I don't necessarily think that they're going to stop. And, and I don't necessarily think that they're going to see 
a loss of power in the areas where they already have power because those are areas that, that they populate and areas that belong to them. They're simply not going to be able to control the entire um, uh, culture that they're trying to control. And they're, they'll continue to try. You'll still see um, an, an insurge, I guess you could say, of, of, of uh, feminists assailing nerd culture with these accusations of misogyny, which is, has really morphed into just feminism for blasphemy um, mm -hmm. and, and stuff like that. But as far as, uh, as far as power is concerned, they're never really going to have power over nerd culture as long as nerds are nerds. The, yep. it, it, rational and, thought and feminism are incompatible. That's it. Okay. And with that, why don't I bring on Evan Lurking, and he has a question about actually exactly what we've been talking about right now, uh, feminism and Gamergate and strategy. So why don't you yeah. take it away, Evan? Hey, how's everyone doing? Oh, we're doing Hi, good. Evan. Hung over. All right. So um, I think it was male disposability that got me into this. Uh, at the same time, I had just seen Anita Sarkeesian's bullshit about whatever the hell she talks about. Um, so Anita Sarkeesian red told me with her tropes versus women in gaming and all that. Yeah. Uh, and I was just wondering a few kind of facets about strategy for what we should be doing in Gamergate. Because a lot of people mm. say ignore the literally who's. Mm. But the problem I see is that they're not going to go away and they're not going to stop rallying support until they're dealt with and kind of exposed. But mm. their followers, their supporters are just blind. Yeah, I, I would agree. I would agree that, that a lot of their supporters are, are really completely blind to what's going on. Uh, people are saying, okay, ignore literally who's. Well, it depends on how, what you mean by ignore. I mean, Yes, ignore when they make like really stupid bullshit comments. They're going to make a ton of them just to bait you. It's it's really what they're doing. They're doing anything and everything that they can to find some way to defame Gamergate. They've they've done everything, and I knew eventually that they would pull out the stops. They would pull out everything. They would um they would try to say that they approved of things like child pornography and stuff like that, but they don't. Hi. <laughs> And, of course, that didn't work. But ultimately, they're going to do anything and everything that they can to bait you. So, yes, ignore that. But don't ignore where they have been completely unethical. Absolutely air that. And let everyone see, the, see it. I have, uh, I'll be right back. <laughs> well, well, I, I, I think it's a good quote here would be to throw, to throw in would be stay on target. Well, yeah, and as as well, right? Like you you don't you don't engage. Uh, like I've had people criticize me, uh, even just the last two videos that I did, because I was engaging them on on a level where I was just by addressing their their arguments, um, I was essentially validating them as something to be taken seriously, right? But the problem is, is that so many people are on autopilot, and because so many feminist talking points and so many feminist slogans and all of those things, they're not just um, they're not just already sort of commonly accepted as true um, at this point. But they they make people feel you know okay, right? Like like oh what you. You know, who doesn't want to help battered women? Who doesn't want to help women who've been raped, right? Like, what kind of monster would not be in favor of that, right? So, I mean, they they, they choose these highly emotional um, subjects to rally support around, like sexual harassment of women, sexual assault of women, um, violence against women, all of these things that we already feel very, very strongly about. And uh, and because of that, uh, when when you are, they've done MRI scans, when you're thinking logically, your emotions are inhibited, and when you're e feeling deep emotions, your logic is inhibited, right? So 
because they're they're poking at all of these highly charged, highly emotional issues, um, people cannot be relied on to think logically about them and say, well, that that actually that actually kind of sounds like bullshit, right? They actually, if they're having an emotional response to begin with, they will let that <clears throat> emotional response carry them through to the conclusion that these feminists want them to draw, which is one of the reasons why Anita Sarkeesian tends to be, you know, that, that reporters don't ask her any hard questions, um, that, that they don't, you know, there, there's never a freaking journalist who plays devil's advocate with her. Um, if there was, she would not appear on that show. Um, you know, so basically, or in that article, she would not be interviewed. Um, she would choose not to be. But so, so you look at that, and you you really do have to attack their arguments, and you have to attack them in a very calm, very logical manner, and say, okay, well, right, th- this is really how it is. One in five or one in 52, which is it, right? Because we've got feminists saying one in five women in college, you know, is assaulted, sexually assaulted, and, and we've got the Bureau of Justice Statistics saying it's one in 52, right? So which is it, right? Is there mm-hmm. an epidemic going on, right? Yes, rape is horrible, but is there an epidemic of rape? Is it really that big a problem? And I, and, uh, I would actually go a different route. Um, I like to, I like to, uh, I like to appropriate their weapons and then use them against them. <laughs> that's that's my favorite. Um, so I will frame the entire discussion in such a way that um, they themselves are the misogynist woman hater. Um, and I don't do it with personal insults. I just do it by deconstructing their own ideology and connecting it to misogyny. And it's it's actually, you know, after that, you pretty much own the frame because you're like, uh, yes, but why are you a misogynist woman hater? <laughs> And and they 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 go they they use that so much that they have no defense against it. It's it's their, they have zero defense against their own weapon. And uh, and if you if you actually get it, if you if you get it just right, you can get them to shut up. And that's that is the most beautiful sound in the universe. Is one of these people shutting up? I would argue that up. you can't really you can't really talk to these folks in their current state. I think that the only way that you would actually get them to consider that they were wrong is when you see the FBI and the IRS showing up at these people's houses and this, uh, and bringing the party van over. Because um, these can we get a have... real quick definition of what the literally who's are? Um, I think I know, but I might be wrong. So what what are the little, literally who's? Okay, so the literally who's, uh, I think number one I'm... is, of course, conspiracy, because uh, she started this whole thing. Um, but it's basically just referring to them without dropping their names so they don't show up in searches and things. Uh, I, well, that makes sense. And there, there's a level of wanting to ignore those people for, for a different – or there's a reason for wanting to ignore those people for that is completely different. They have a habit of using um, discussion about them as an excuse to get you banned from Twitter. They've been doing mm-hmm. it to judgy uh, quite a bit, particularly uh, – yeah, Anita Sarkeesian um, and, and Jessica Valenti. You can't talk about either one of them um, without, especially if you're remotely connected to a discussion involving Judgy Bitch, because then she'll get banned over it. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's like a, this huge silencing tool. Uh, Jessica Valenti was mentioned on the internet. Ban Judgy Bitch. <laughs> um, but <laughs> yeah, yeah I mean, talking... they've, they've been doing that. They've been doing yeah. that a lot. And yeah. another thing to do to remember, if you are at all engaging with these people, you need to speak. Um, <laughs> you need to speak well. You don't don't curse at them. You need to, if you're going to call them a name, say to them like your your behavior is deplorable. <laughs> you know, break out your <laughs> your thesaurus. Don't don't buy into like these. Just into name calling. Say like, okay, oh, wait, your wait, 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 Rachel. I'm going to disagree here. I think you can safely call them misogynists and women haters because they oh, have. Yeah, I like, referred to Anita's behavior as a murdergasm and didn't get banned. 
So I, it, 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 it depends on who you are. Um, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm nobody, so I didn't, I wasn't important enough to ban. Um, but uh, at least on, especially on Twitter. Um, but, you know, rather than uh, engaging them directly, that I don't see any problem with, you know, screen capping their bullshit and making fun of it that way. Uh, also, it, it's not necessary to act out of line. Yeah. yeah, report them well, as they act out of line. line. If they've done something they do. that violates pi- the policies in Twitter, I see no, no issue in reporting them. If they're saying point, something point like, out, uh, like they want to get gamers to kill themselves or that they think that these people should die or that person should hang themselves, yeah, report them. Yeah. <laughs> point out their That's abusive what, behavior, point out their logical fallacies, but the main thing is to discuss discuss the issue. The people aren't as important as the issues. Well, and, Jessica and also is just a person who says things. It's the things yeah, that that are being talked about that are important. The concepts that matter. Yeah, and you're not gonna you're not gonna change Jessica Valenti's mind. What you're trying to do is change everyone's mind about Jessica Valenti. Right, that's what you're trying to do. So you don't you don't even need to tweet anything at Jessica Valenti. I think that's that's foolish. Exactly. Um, you know, like that. Y- you basically you just uh, you tweet it at everybody else, right? Yeah. Um, you 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 basically call them on their bullshit, but you don't do it to their faces because they're never like. And this is one of the things that that I've encountered over you know the last four years is that it's extremely hard to find a feminist who's willing to actually sit down and have a debate. And the closest well, I came... nothing from it. The closest I came was uh, in New Hampshire with Naomi Wolf. And I can guarantee you she knew nothing about me, right? I was just some schmuck. They, they Googled my name. And they're like, oh, she has this tiny little YouTube channel. She's like, she's just like, she's just like a nobody, Right, we don't need to learn anything about her position or anything like that, right? So she has she had no idea what she was in for, and the moderator was extremely biased in her favor, and even said right at the outset of the panel discussion that you know she was worried that Naomi, if 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 things didn't go well on this panel, Naomi might renege on her keynote address at the convention, right? And yeah, okay. So of course the, the the moderator was like was extremely like let Naomi interrupt me constantly and then any time I wanted to interject she's like no 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 you let you let Naomi finish her point right it was it was ridiculous right and I still kicked her ass right and she was furious afterwards absolutely and like you you will not ever get to convince a feminist to sit down and answer the actual questions, right? Well, you I might, guarantee they're, they're like Kim Jong Un in the Don't you interview. know that logic they, and honesty are rape? Only yeah. approved yeah. questions okay, okay. allowed, right? All right. Well, I want to. I want to. I want to say, Karen. I have actually had conversations with feminists where they've conceded points, but they have never been uh, public figures. Like no. it's, it's, yeah. that just doesn't happen. It, it's they, like, yeah, they've never had a career based on what they were saying. No. No. Yeah, they, um, they don't and, exploit it for money. <laughs> no, and you might be able to talk to a feminist who is not uh, a, 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 I don't know, a, a professional feminist, um, and they might concede points. But I think that you're, it's a lost cause with these professional feminists because they draw a paycheck from being a victim. And how do you argue with yeah, that? Yeah, right? never tried well, that. Well, and they draw social status. Guys, 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 guys let me services. start again. In this again, we do need to move on to another caller because we're, we're there stacking up. So I wanted to. Um, well, I got one last thing to say about this. One sentence. Me too. The real goal has to be about informing the public and influencing social change, not persuading feminists. It doesn't matter how many feminists you do or don't persuade, they are in the minority. It's the general public that you need to talk to. And I just mm, want to add you. on to that. Yeah, just one thing. It's it's not long. Uh, what we what you're going to need, what's going to be the most successful thing for Gamergate is expanding. I don't know how you're going to go about doing it, but you need to find a way to I drop do. information to drop information bombs on people outside of the internet. It needs to to expand. You need to to find a way to get this message to other people 
who have been locked out of this because people have been banned from speaking about this on certain platforms? I can tell you a way to do that. Print little informational flyers, little just blurbs on paper, single sentences, cartoons that you find on the Internet, doesn't matter what it is. Leave them in public restrooms. Everybody poops. People will see it. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks for that, Rachel and uh, Hannah, and thank you for calling in, Evan, and and, uh, bringing up some very important points. And we're going to move now to Nexus. Hi, thanks for for taking my call. Uh, I just wanted to offer a cautionary tale uh, based on my experience. Uh, I um, had the misfortune of attending the same university as Emma Watson, where I got totally indoctrinated in the ways of the social justice warriors. And... um, and they uh, they immersed me in the uh, the male threat narrative, and they even had a, a rape list in the women's bathroom, um, where uh, anonymous accusations were written down. And uh, in the course of that, I uh, ended up um, internal, internalizing a lot of male disposability, and um, eventually caught uh, chronic fatigue syndrome. And uh, I think this was a result of me um, overworking myself, not getting enough sleep, and every time I started to recover. I'd overwork myself again because I thought it was my duty, and um, eventually I, I figured, uh, uh, got in touch with the uh, men's rights movement and uh, figured out that I, that I was doing this to myself and that it was uh, um, it was this um, uh, cultural misandry uh, played a big part in that. So uh, I just wanted to offer that out. That seems to be um, a, a pretty common experience, actually. Uh, I, I've actually heard that uh, from a lot of guys that that have um, have had to pull themselves out of feminism. And I, I've got some close friends that have been through that, where they were pretty much taught to hate themselves or or to not value themselves and and to just work themselves to death or or white knight themselves to death. Um, because of the environment that they lived in, and it does take it, it does take other people sometimes to help pull them out of it, and that's why what we were talking about before, spreading that information, um, and and my suggestion about leaving uh, bits and pieces of information in public places like that, particularly public restrooms, um, that that was meant in seriousness. That is something that, uh, especially in men's restrooms, because it, it's less likely that they'll be removed um, by by angry women in a men's restroom. Not that women never go into the men's restroom, but um, it is less likely to be removed from in there. And and it's very important that men have, who've been through what you've been through reach out to other men and help them through the same situation, help them out of that same darkness. All right. Yeah, no, I'd have to agree. It's it's extremely it's it's extremely sad. Um, sometimes every once in a while we have someone on Reddit on the men's rights subreddit post that he you know was raised by a feminist mother in a single mother household with a feminist grandmother and and uh, and it really is uh, I think I think it is child abuse uh, in so many ways. To put that on your kid, you're you're essentially instilling uh, like sort of an inherent guilt um, in your child right from an early age, um, and sort of a, a a need on the part of that child to constantly apologize for what they are. It, it is like it, it's very very much like when uh, say a mother who's divorced badmouths the father in front of the children. Um, and you know, says he's a horrible person, and this and that, because these children are are half half of their identity comes from their father. So basically, what this mother is telling her children is half of you is bad, right? Half of you is bad and terrible and horrible and and lazy and a scumbag, right? And it, it's just there are there are so many kids who grow up, so many boys who grow up. And, and this is one of the things that, that drives me crazy because once you're an adult male, if you've had a healthy upbringing, um, 
you know, the the portrayal of men in media, the portrayal of men as either villains or bumbling idiots, um, you know, all of these things, right? You can you can shrug them off if if you're a healthy male with a healthy sense of masculinity as an adult, right? But if you're a boy and all you see is a steady diet of male bashing, right? Um, like, what what are we doing to our boys? Like, I, I just, I don't understand how we don't see anything wrong with that. Particularly since so many of our boys don't have a male, an adult male role model in their lives on a daily basis. I think Allison did disappear. Yeah, it Anybody? seems like, Hello? did we lose Allison? I don't, I don't know, did we? I think maybe, I think maybe we did. Did we lose Rachel too? No, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I've I've found that there's a mute button on my phone, so I've been using it. <laughs> ah, okay. Did uh, Allison? Are you muted? Oh, sorry. I've been uh, talking in the back room. I apologize. Yeah. Well, we're, oh, that's okay. Uh, I think we're, we're so what, what's, are you guys run down run down to a stop? Or are you on the shoals of topics? Has, yeah. Is the carriage uh, train? Derailed. I think it was a. I think we're we're good with this one, and um, you know, if if we're done with that, we could also expand upon. Okay, let's upon... move on then. Uh, thank you, Nexus. And um, let us go to Travis. Travis, you're on board. Yes, the very same Travis who Matthew on Christmas Day had referred to in your previous open line, approximately 131 minutes in. Thank you. Uh, that was very thorough. I, First of all, I, have, I I have no memory of that, but then I don't even remember what I ate for dinner like an hour ago. So. From what I understand, you are very drunk, and I do not mind that. That's okay. I'm not Happy very not drunk. She's hungover. I'm, She's hungover. I'm hungover. No, oh, I like think? almost like I only got drunk once when I was 16, and I like vomited in a toilet, and I couldn't like see on the way home. But that was like. A long time ago, I don't know what it's like being drunk. Oh, see, here here with me, I, I had to spend New Year's Eve with my mother-in-law, and so in order to not vomit, I had to drink. Oh, that's okay. Oh. All right, well, first of all... <laughs> Actually, I, I just want to I just want to clarify, in case she would ever listen to this, that I really love and appreciate my mother-in-law. She's a sweet lady. She's a little crazy, but she's very sweet and well intended. Mine, too, because uh, I have a, heard her tragic backstory that I don't want to get into because I'm on a radio show. Anyway, first of all, I would like to say thank you for the first of many times. What you said about how I should not live my life in fear of allegations really calms my mind. Hearing you say that snaps me out of a McCarthyism-like fear I've been holding all autumn. Oh, oh, now I remember. Now, now I remember you. Um, yeah, no... I think I think it's it's really I mean like it's it's always something that it's like situational awareness, right? Um I guess. Situational awareness is you're aware of your situation, you're aware that like a meteor could fall out of the sky at any moment and beam you in the back of the head, but probably not. Oh, and I have enough situational awareness in that case to uh prep a Z Day base like a zombie yeah. apocalypse. Yeah. But, but you just you just sort of you have to sort of tone it down and be like, well, I'm aware of my situation. I'm aware of all of the potential dangers in it, including tripping over my shoelaces and falling in front of the subway, right? Um, That's the best part. But <laughs> but but does that mean that I should go about my entire day in sort of an obsessive fear of something happening to happening to me? No. Um, yeah, I had like this red scareish feeling going on, like a pink scare instead with. Bulbas yeah. and insane people with long hair and makeup or whatever you want to call it. But, yeah, I was just going nuts. And I was like, oh, my God, these women could throw me in jail just for looking at them wrong. And you're just like, no, that almost never happens. And I'm like, uh, oh, God. Well, it doesn't It doesn't happen. Like, it's not something – I mean, like, it's something that happens to some people, of course. Um, but it, it's really not something that I think – think I would genuinely live in fear of I mean like you're you're much probably much more likely to get into an accident in your car than you are to be 
you know, falsely accused of rape by some random woman who picks your face, your, your profile off of Facebook because she needs an excuse for not passing her bar exams. Right. Or stare raping her for having the res- enough respect for her to hold eye contact. Yeah. So. All right. Yeah, well. It's just one of those things that that you know, like you you sort of, it's something that that it's like one of the many 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 dangers. You get stung by a bee. You know, people are scared of tigers. People in Canada are scared of bears. They're more likely to die. Of course. Right. Well, I'm about a fifth into this, so I don't want to waste too much of your time. My right, second thank you is for. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Keep keep going. Go ahead. All right. My second thank you is for covering Gamergate and its events so thoroughly, even up to now with current events surrounding the video game hatred, which I want to buy because I think it looks awesome. I'm a Gamergator. Rar. Here are my mandibles, and I spend what? my time teaching NEET needs how to write business level complaint letters on Full Chan. So I held my own piece of that pie when that fire was rising. All I have to say is that when literally Wu isn't busy feeding the media lies about A-Chan, she's depriving financially vulnerable, crippled midgets, sources of income. Screw you, John Walker. Your sex change operation is laughably fake, and you have very little game development talent, if any at all. All right. Now I shall lead to my question. (laughs) Okay. I was calling to share my thoughts on female behavior and how it affects men. I had originally grown up at a high school which had the whole nine yards in terms of cliches. A noticeable handful of girls were pregnant or the type of boisterous valley girl that would make your ears curl up and tuck themselves into their respective canals. I recall a duo of females who would attempt to arouse me, although I had been so horrified by teenage pregnancies that I vowed to remain asexual to the moment I received my diploma. They would do things but just purposely bending forward with me behind them to try rubbing their butts on my crotch. I remember one would consistently come up to me cla- between classes, braless, like fully braless. She would rub her clearly pert nipples in front of me through her tank top or whatever top tauntingly. These young ladies had no shame. However, they were clearly degenerate in my opinion because they just had that valley girl attitude. But I think they openly pursued sexual teasing of me in particular because I lack social media outlets. I don't have a Facebook or Twitter. I feel that they do this because I purposely avoid female socialization like the plague. I always felt uncomfortable when they would do this. Does this count as sexual harassment? If so, do you think that anyone would ever take it seriously, even if it does make the subjected party feel sexually uncomfortable? Well, yes, it does, it does absolutely. count as yeah, that challenges sexual, sexual harassment. harassment. Um, and you are not alone because uh, the latest studies coming out of uh, high schools and, and colleges find that I believe for, between 42 and 53% of men report some form of sexual assault. Um, uh, and this is sexual assault. This is not. Assault, like junk grabbing and. Yeah. And Does that include um, falsified reports, like reports that were no, proven that false? No, that doesn't include false reports. That probably oh, would increase the number significantly. So we're looking at about one and two. And I'm not talking about sexual harassment when I say sexual assault. I'm talking about actual sexual, unwanted sexual touching. Um, And that's Uh. 50%. And if you look at just the statistics on unwanted sexual intercourse, they're looking at about one in five. And that's just college and, and high school men. That's up to yeah, college. Is this, this the neo, is this the neo-feminist crud or is this legit? Well, the, uh, uh, it the, probably the, is based. No, no. Well, I, is, I've I've looked at the I've looked at the actual methodology, and I can I can answer that question very clearly. Oh, good. Um, the physically forced sexual the 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 way that they structured the the questionnaire was a little bit um, confusing and difficult, and I would not have done that in this manner. But okay. if you look at just physically forced sexual intercourse, you're still looking at about one in five. Um, and the other behaviors all involve physical touching. So if it's unwanted physical touching, that's sexual battery right off the bat. Um, they also had this really bizarre category that they called seduction, which was essentially a woman sexually touching a man and him expressing that he is not interested in sexual contact and her continuing to persist until he gives in to having sex with her. Now, uh, I don't know why they called that seduction, I think that that was really stupid on the part of the of the researchers. I think it's another one of those Mary Koss 
made to penetrate bullshit um, statistical chicanery uh, because that doesn't sound like seduction to me. It sounds like so, I wouldn't necessarily call it rape, but it certainly doesn't. It doesn't sound very pleasant. I'm going to. Uh, I'm so going to whole... actually. I'm going to. I'm going to grind down your because people when you make decisions when you say no to someone that actually takes effort. Uh, so I'm going to grind down your ability to say no until you say yes to me. Again, I don't know so if that's the, necessarily it, rape. It's concave. It's not rape thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's concave. It's not rape. It has to be convex, or or is it concave that it's rape and it's convex that it isn't? It's something, well, you know, it's, some sort of if, distinction. If, if 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 one person has a tab A and the other person has a slot B, the person with the tab A is the rapist, and the person with the slot B is the rapey. Yeah, but what if it's a tab B and a slot A? Same thing. Same thing. Okay. The person with yeah, but the tab is the rapist, and the person with the slot A is the rapey. Is, but you know, there's 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 a meaningful distinction here. There really is. You know, there it really is a meaningful distinction. It's not the well, difference between something convex Brent, and concave. Brent Sokolow, um, who is the president of the National Center for Education Higher Education Risk Man Management, um, and he has uh, he for the last ten fifteen years or something like that um, has consulted with over three thousand universities in the United States on their sexual misconduct policies and and the whole bit from a feminist pro feminist perspective of, of of trying to prevent sexual assaults of women and, and adjudicate them, make it easier to expel male students, the whole bit, right? And even he came out in an open letter to all of his clients saying, Okay, over the last two months I have been asked to consult on X number of, of adjudications that involved hookups that were clearly not rape, right? Where the only reason why there was a finding of misconduct on the part of, of the man in that case is because he was the male. That is a Title IX violation because you have two people, one male and one female, who engage in the exact same behavior, right? Calling one of them a rapist, right, is a violation of Title IX. It's a violation of anti-discrimination laws, right? He has actually come out and and said, you know, like this is this is getting fucking ridiculous, right? And this is the guy who orchestrated most of it. I actually had to go find Cherry, so I didn't listen to your rant. I'm sorry, Karen. I'll flagellate myself later. You should actually I, I, do it now on I, on the radio. I, 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 okay. <laughs> oh, there we go. Censor duck. I will kill that duck. Censor duck must make an appearance in every show or else the the, the, the listeners will go into withdrawal. Uh, yeah. you know, they love the sound of this fucking thing. Huh? All right. Okay. Well, yeah, but that's Amazon, what Censor duck had to say about uh, I wanted to thank, uh, I wanted to thank, oh gosh, I'm like mixing everybody up now. I want to thank Travis for bringing that point up. It's a very good point, and I appreciate the call. Uh, we're going to move on to, who Who shall I bring on? I think I'll bring on Duran. Duran, you're Hello. on the air. Hi. Oh, great. How are you? How are you? Oh, I'm doing well. I got my sensor deck by my side, and... And and Karen fuming somewhere in 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 Alberta, but we don't care because we're in Saskatchewan. Yeah, <laughs> I'm here, sitting with my cat. Uh, yeah, I'm okay. uh, calling. Um, well, uh, just to pull away from the truly uh, feminist interaction and just a, a men's issue, or a, a mostly men's issue, is post-traumatic stress disorder and depression and um seeking help now uh, uh well not too long ago i was um well victim of a violent crime and uh yeah you know, i was on a motorcycle and some guy tried to run me over and oh. Oh my so uh, uh, yeah um <laughs> crashed uh -oh. broke my femur and yeah i've been sort of doing the recovery since then. Okay, and so... 
Mm-hmm. So what? What, Sorry, go ahead. You, what was the You're a little choppy, so. So um, so um, calling about uh, well, basically the the response that I got was, uh, you'll be fine, uh, toughen up, you know, walk it off, um, which is kind of funny considering broken femur. But, um, and as opposed to any supportive or yeah, assisting um, motion that uh, seems to be anywhere else. And it's, uh, yeah, is that a, a typically male thing or is that um, common, you know, cross gender or, yeah, it, you know, is it? The, you mean the suck it up and drive on attitude people have towards men who have been through a yeah. trauma? Yeah. No, no, that that's, that's right. gendered for it. Uh, for the most part. Yeah, that is, that is very gendered. Well, it, um, it's, and it's gendered in the sense that it's only aimed at men, but it's not gendered in the sense that it, it is actually sort of, I think equally the sentiment of both men and women, right? It's both men yeah, and women. It's not, it jumps from both sexes. And move on. But it's it's very much aimed at men. It's it's oh, like yeah. men aren't supposed to have an emotional response to a situation that would be. I mean, what what you described very briefly there would be absolutely terrifying. Uh, you know, I I have only witnessed motorcycle accidents. I've never been on a motorcycle, and I'm afraid to be on a motorcycle. And people actually take that as a legitimate fear and never tell me, well, I should suck it up and try it because I'm a girl. I get out of having to face that girl, fear because I'm a girl. And I know it. And and if I were male, people would call me a, a coward for not trying to overcome that fear. Um, and, you know, just the fact that you've actually been through a near-death experience because somebody tried, essentially tried to kill you because on a motorcycle, you're incredibly vulnerable. And and get told, you know, suck it up and drive on. Once you heal up from this injury, you should be fine. You shouldn't have any emotional response to this. It, it's a, a huge amount of bullshit from society that gets dumped on men. But it is very gendered. Um, mm. And and it well, is. Well, and I think I think too that it's it's gendered um, in such a way that women get too much of things in the other direction. Women don't. Get oh yeah. Enough. They don't get enough, well, you know, you need to toughen up a little bit. Um, men get way too much of you just need to suck it up and play through yeah. the pain and all of that, right? So, and it you know, it, it would be really wonderful if we wounded. could find some kind of compromise in the middle where, yeah. you know, there was there was room for compassion but also an expectation that, you know what, you're going to get over this um, because otherwise Karen, you're useless to yourself or anyone else, right? Karen, Karen mm. that sounds mm-hmm. like gender equality. Or I know. I know. It, 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 Ginger it, equality I don't know is rape. Uh, it, it, <laughs> it, I, I know. I, I think that the only way to get gender equality is to reduce women down to victims in every conceivable circumstance and tell men to save them. That's the only way to no, have equality. Because oh, yeah. Yes. Karen, Karen just got done Emma, raping. Emma, Emma. I didn't realize we had Emma Watson on the line. Seriously, that's the only way to create equality is to reduce women down to victims in every conceivable instant and tell men to save them. Of course, how men are going to save women from needing to be saved by men, um, I don't know. That wait, wait, that doesn't exist. That it's not that that does not compute. It, it's it, men have to save women because women need to be it's saved. But, but but if but but the but the then if, if women need to be saved, they can never actually do it for themselves, and then men will always need to be more powerful than women to be able to save them. So that makes patriarchy can I inevitable. Get an amen? And, and <laughs> I, 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 my brain, Those my brain, women must I, be I, I, saved. <laughs> yeah, that, well, I, and then I, we have, and then I we have like, men who, uh, whenever they go through some trouble, they're either, uh, you know, cowards or faking it. But we have those toxic masculinity. So, you know, which one is it exactly? Are we going to, you know, allow men to actually have a support system? Uh, or are we going to force them to not uh, ask for help because there is no help and then also berate them for this toxic masculinity? Like that seems uh, like doubling the insult. Oh, what I love is is how feminists are like, well, men should be able to talk about their feelings and express their vulnerabilities, and they should be able to talk about their problems, and they shouldn't have to worry about being 
policed and, and you know, and, and ground down because they're weak and all of this, right? So men should be able to be able to do all of this stuff. And then the most, uh, the, the purest elixir of that, of men talking about their issues, talking about their problems, talking about their vulnerabilities, and, and, sh- and sharing their feelings is the men's rights movement. And what do feminists call them? A bunch of whining piss babies. Or somehow they're an insult to them. Yes. Somehow they're an insult to oh, women you need uh, to talk by about your feelings. But not like that. asserting their feelings. <laughs> so, okay, I'm yeah, bring, no, I really, I'm feel, I really feel for the caller. I'm I bringing really Duran back on because he has an, an additional point about uh, mm. Tumblr feminists and the horrible, horrible ravages that they face on the Internet. So go ahead, Duran. Oh, oh, no. Make your point. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, yeah, well, th- I mean, there's a lot of screaming and yelling about nothing, but, I mean, one in particular that pissed me off is, I can't remember who it was, um, claiming that she had post-traumatic stress disorder from um, uh, people commenting on her Twitter feed. or uh, Melody uh, Hensley? Yeah. Melody Hensley, yeah. She, um, she works for the Center for Inquiry in Washington, D.C., and that should disturb anybody who is an atheist. Oh yeah, no, and a skeptic. And one of the hilarious things was when 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 there were veterans of war who were criticizing her for tweeting for saying that she got post traumatic stress disorder from Twitter, right? And criticizing her for that for that and saying, "Lady, like you got no fucking clue what you're talking about, right? I was in a fucking war zone, right? She tried to get them fired." It's unbelievable. She uh, tried of, to get them fired. Yeah. Um, and I want to thank Duran, and I, I, even though I'm I'm also at the moment in a parallel universe, completely speechless at the bullshit that feminists... Uh, in this universe, I'm pretty much inured to it. I think I got a, some sort of feminist-shaped callus in my brain. Um, but mm-hmm. I want to thank Duran for, <laughs> Duran for that. And uh, yeah, I wonder what a feminist color. shaped callus looks like. And Duran, <laughs> hopefully you'll have you'll have an okay recovery, and just try and find help where you can find it, and uh, yeah, and find sympathy and compassion where you can find it. And good yeah, luck. Feminist shaped callus is is in the shape of one of those female symbols with the fist in it. Does anyone ever feel like the fist kind of looks like, you know, someone fisted into a womb? The feminist symbol looks like it's fisting a giant vagina. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, yeah, it does. All right, ladies, let's not get disgusting here. Get your mind <laughs> out of the gutter. What is I wrong can, with you? What the fuck? There are so many things I can think that are far from. more disgusting than a fist in a vagina. All right, enough. <laughs> that we That's true. This show. Like a fist I'm not going to say this is disgusting. I'm not going to say this is disgusting. It's just we got to move on. And uh, okay. fisting is, is probably not entirely appropriate for this caller. But uh, Green Knight, okay, um, you sorry. are on board, so uh, I apologize for coming on board with this particular topic, but it is what it is in the silly place. Green Knight, are you there? Uh, yeah, I'm here. Uh, just let me turn my phone off speaker for a second. I've got sort of a phobia of my mute button since last week. Mm-hmm. All right. We all had problems with our mute buttons. It's it's it, it's mutitis. It's catching. I don't it's have a mute button. button on my phone, so and we're yeah, all calling in as no, far as Karen. I know on our phone. No, so that's that's why we have censor duck because uh, okay. Karen has no brakes or a mute button. Okay, go ahead. Oh. Good night. Uh, anyway, so since last week, I had uh, another subject that I wanted to talk about originally, but then a uh, fellow came on last week about his experiences as a male victim of female aggressor rape, and that had me wanting to talk about something else first. Um, I'm a forum moderator, actually, and a little while back, we I had one of our members talking about uh, his experiences with that exact same situation, and while I was trying to help him, I came across a resource called MaleSurvivor.org. It is a website out there that's pretty much a help group for people in that exact situation. And uh, his reports to me about his experiences over there, it was very, very liberating for him to see all the resources they have that dispel the typical myths to do with 
uh, male victims in those situations, and I think it would be a great place for people who are facing this situation to check out. That's excellent. Like any any reason, yes. especially if it gets if it gets a good review from somebody who's tried it out. That that's definitely. I mean, because you do have to be cautious. Some some resources that allow males will still try and treat you as if, if you were uh, a woman survivor of something. And uh, and as Tom Golden would say, uh, men don't necessarily respond the same way to those kinds of things, right? Mm. Um, so yeah, but I'd, it, I'd actually have to. I, I'm going to disagree br- briefly. I wonder if women really respond well to this stuff either. Because it really, it ultimately, is it about getting women over this shit or about maintaining them in this victim mentality? I think I think there's definitely a, a point to be made about that. And I think that any any space that is feminist, um, that has feminist leanings, is going to be unhealthy for both men and women victims. Uh, for male victims, they're going to be always considered an outsider and somebody who's there on sufferance. And for female victims, it's not about healing. It's about scab picking and uh, and nursing grudges and expanding those grudges. Now it's not just this one man who did something bad to you. It's now all of society and all of masculinity that has done something bad to you. Um, A siege so, mentality. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but it's it's good. I, we do have uh, malesurvivor.org as a as a resource to point people to, but it's good to have some actual evidence that it's a, it's a good resource. Because like Karen was saying, there are um, there can be some serious problems with supposed male re- resources for male victims, or even female victims of female rapists. Um, as if you if you fall outside of their ideological scope, these so-called survivor services they sort of treat you like you are, are a person non grata, um, or they trivialize. Uh, what happened to you because it doesn't fit their narrative and what what is uh, useful for them politically um the uh one of the things that happened uh that I, I experienced was there was this website called no seriously what about the men's does anybody else remember that website i remember that noah brand exactly. and osmandius yes and um i remember that um Jen, uh Oh, I'm blank. James Landritz uh, posted a uh, a um, an article on his experience on there, and he talked about as a survivor of of a female perpetrated rape. And what was interesting about his experience is he was at the time a serviceman, and he was raped by a female civilian. And what is really interesting is that is actually statistically uh, one of the most common forms of rape in the military. Uh, and people usually they, nobody nobody reports on this, but statistically, one of the most common forms of rape in the military is a female civilian taking advantage of a male um, soldier. And um, one of the reasons why is because who's going to believe him, right? <laughs> All she well, has to and do and on top of that, he's say, well, I mean, he's in a uniform. Uh, he is he, he's he's sort of an object uh, of attraction, right? He's yeah. for women, um, yeah. and and so more likely, uh, women would be more likely to target maybe somebody in uniform and then on top of that, of course, like why wouldn't he, how how on earth couldn't he defend himself from that yeah. and prevent that, right? But so, that's and, how she, that's essentially how she raped him, was Well, she was um, pregnant if you, at the time, right? As far as I remember. Yeah, and, and she essentially said, and his first who concern they was, I don't want to hurt her or the baby so I can't fight back. But the other thing is she is, actually she said, told him that. Yeah, she yeah. she told him that he she would file a false rape back of um, a false account of the situation, and of course, uh, military men are under such incredibly close scrutiny um, in terms of their sexuality that it's a very effective way for a female civilian rapist to to have sex or rape male military is to essentially say that is I will bring up a charge of rape and. The like the, the the military is so on high alert about this kind of thing. It's effective. Oh yeah, your whole, when, whole career they're under is strictly Your whole career is gone. Just... Your whole career is gone. So in, oh, even so or is, even is, I'm not even going to say you raped me. I'm just going to because you're married. I'm just going to say well you had sex with me and then your mm-hmm. career is also done. 
Yeah, because and adultery that's the thing. A guy can get, also can get a huge for adultery in the military. Yeah, and so it's like it's a huge threat to for civilian women to do this, and it, it makes it very easy for them to rape military men. And I remember when uh, he was talking about this, and he said as a male survivor, he has to sort of uh, walk on eggshells around female survivors to make them feel comfortable. And I asked him this question. I said, did you ever consider asking women to walk on eggshells around you? And um, what I was getting at was, um, I mean, had he ever gotten to the point where he expected that same kind of, I guess, respect from women as he was willing to give, even as a male survivor of a female rapist, to women? And, of course, <coughs> Noah just dropped on me like a ton of bricks um, and said something like, oh, oh, you're you're questioning female survivors' experiences. And with, it, putting words in my mouth, in fact, um, yeah. because I wasn't. I wasn't. I was asking him if he had thought about asking, um, you know, women to, to consider him in that way, if that had ever crossed his mind. Um, and it was I was really more interested in the fact that that, that sort of suggests a marginalization of male victims of sexual assault in these centers. I mean, even a vi- male victim of sexual assault has to walk on eggshells around women. Um, yeah. You know, and it, and that was what I was getting at. But anyway, so the, the supposed safe space jumped on me like a ton of bricks, banned me. And it actually, I, I, I usually don't talk about this kind of stuff, but it actually, um, in, it, in me, it inspired some suicidal ideation for a month. Um, I still have the scars. Um, and uh, I, I don't mean to play the victim, but because I, I take responsibility for that kind of shit, but it was triggering because not only did they minimize, because I, I am myself a survivor, which I don't like talking about, but whatever, not only did they minimize what I had gone through and my questions and the way I was dealing with what I was dealing with, um, but they also accused me of triggering other survivors or being cruel to other survivors, and it was just it was just a perfect storm of shit in my brain at that moment. Yeah. And uh, so... I, I go had ahead. a similar experience in a different forum. I'm not going to um, talk about it here, but I know exactly what you're talking about. I, I've been through something very similar to that, just not in as well-known of a venue. Yeah, it's uh, and like uh, where the upshot of this is, yeah, you have to be careful about where you talk about these things. If you are a survivor of non-ideological, uh, uh, if you're an unworthy survivor, in other words, of uh, of the inconvenient rapes, as it were, or if you're a survivor of of, um, of the rapes that they find politically expedient, you also sort of have to be careful because they will damage you further by turning you, giving, try to promote a siege mentality and, and uh, promote um, this, this, this attitude that the whole world is against you or all, the men, all men in the world are against you. So it's, yeah. it's generally... Or if your but, survival doesn't suit their narrative. Yeah, exactly. But thank you for bringing that up, Green Knight. It's, uh, it's always good to know that there, a resource is as it builds itself. Um, yeah. And did, did you have anything else to add to that, Earl? Um. Not that particular point. I um, would like to kind of go on to the original subject that I came on for. All right, go right yeah. ahead. But, um, uh, am I on? Yep. Oh, yep, okay. you are on. All right. Anyway, so uh, what I was thinking of doing is I'm trying to get things together for a radio program that I was wanting to do related somewhat peripherally to Gamergate, um, more on the subject of uh, on feminism in particular. Um, uh, this is going to require a little bit of background. Um, I, I haven't heard it talked about on Honey Badger Radio, but uh, are you aware of the, uh, well, I'm pretty sure you're aware of the Rebuild Initiative within Gamergate? I am not. I've oh. heard a little bit about it. Um, is is that uh, where they're trying to uh, create new media venues uh, that aren't? Um, um, not quite. Are, I um, what it, what it's about is that uh, you know all of the talk about the uh, journalists who are corrupt and doing all of these bad things and pointing out how all of them are doing these horrible things. Um, it's all a bunch of attacking the people who are 
doing things that are wrong. Um, but uh, one of the things that uh, the gamer data is very aware of is that uh, we don't just want to call them out on their bad stuff. We also need uh, positive voices within the uh, games journalism community, and it's an effort to essentially call out the or shout out, give a shout out to the uh, journalists who are doing things that are good for both Gamergate and uh, games journalism. If they are positive on Gamergate, Gamergate tries very hard to make sure it's known that these people were positive about it. And pretty much it's positive reinforcement is what it is. Anyway. I think it's a great so, idea. That's awesome. Yeah. I think I think that that's ultimately, uh, I, I have my own personal opinions about Gamergate that I'll get into in due course, but I think a movement towards building something new is a really great idea. And uh, moving away from just criticizing uh, what's existing to creating an alternative is the true source of revolution. So good on you. Good, good yeah. to do that. Uh, yes. It's a really anyway. necessary and needed thing, actually. Mm. Yeah. Anyway, so uh, before I say this much, I need to uh, express this. I am very much and have been in the anti-feminist camp. I was brought into the anti-feminism uh, about April, right by Karen Strong, by the way, uh, oh. right when the <laughs> when the social justice warrior thing was starting to ramp up and it uh, kind of built up before Gamergate yeah. happened and. So I've been following all this since the beginning, mainly due to you guys giving it such great coverage. Um, anyway, so I've been looking into some other streams on Gamergate, and I've realized something uh, on certain streams. Um, one that I'm particularly noticed in is uh, Oliver Campbell's stream. Um, he, there's a, it's not, okay, how let me start over. Uh, yeah, there are actually uh, quite a few feminist, feminists within Gamergate that are very much not of the social justice warrior variety. They are, if anything, diametrically opposed to the social justice warriors, see them as the absolute bane of feminism. They really do not like these people. They want them to go away, stop ruining feminism. These people are the source of what's giving feminism a bad name. Get rid of them, fight against them harshly. And that kind of struck a chord with me, with my particular stance on anti-feminism and the not all feminists are like that line, basically. My primary argument against the not all feminists are like that is, yeah, but uh, the silent majority is silent, and therefore, if they are not actually taking efforts to fight against the extremists, then they're really not helping things. Um, so, well, what what got what gets me is okay because you have you have all of these feminists right, and they have allowed uh, they have <coughs> they basically bought the. So the PR version of feminism, the PR version of feminism uh, that kind of basically says that uh, default mother custody is the fault of the patriarchy when really it was brought about by feminist activism in the late 1800s, mm -hmm. um, that women weren't allowed to take out mortgages or loans in their own name in the 1950s and 60s when they were by right. They had the right, every right to, but lenders had every right to reject them based on the fact that women couldn't be held legally accountable for their own debts uh, with their father or their husband who could be held accountable for that. So, of course, they required a male, male co-signer um, if somebody yep. is not legally responsible for their debts. You don't lend them money in their own name, right? And lenders were allowed. There was no law forbidding lenders to require a male co-signer, even though women had every right to take out a loan, right? All of these things, right? But they... they they have bought into this really feel-good um, sort of version of the entirety of feminist history. Uh, you know, the first wave it was just, the second wave was just, 
Yeah, no, none yeah, of it. No. <laughs> none of it had clean hands. Um, none of it was really particularly interested in equality of responsibilities and obligations in, the, in addition to rights and freedoms, right? Right. So um, you have you have these these feminist women now who are finally finally saying, "Oh my God, they totally made that man cry on on national TV over his T-shirt." Or over his over his bowling shirt, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and and that's finally going too far, right? Yeah. That's finally going too far, right? Like all of this other stuff, this was all fine, right? You know, it was patriarchal privilege when men got custody of the kids, but they got the entire job of feeding and sheltering them, right? So mm-hmm. men got the kids because men got the bill. That was patriarchal privilege. Then feminism came along, changed all that, gave women the kids, stuck men with the bill, right? So women right. got the kids, men got the bill, right? And even that, that they, they called that patriarchy. That's patriarchy, right? It's not because right. feminists wanted that and women wanted it. No, it's patriarchy, right? Like, they, they've, that, was not, that was not an injustice, according to these women. Or if it was an injustice, it was an injustice perpetrated by the patriarchy, not by feminists, Right? And and now it's it's only now where they're like where where you have feminists uploading videos where good morning is considered catcalling and and where a man's choice of of shirt is is what's keeping women out of STEM fields, right? And and all of this shit, right? All of this frivolous bullshit that they're they're making they're they're finally making mountains out of other people's molehills instead of making their own mountains. And, and squashing other people with them, right? Now they're taking other people's molehills and making mountains of them. And and now, finally now is the time to put our foot, feet down, our collective foot down and say, well, that's not my kind of feminism. All of this other feminism, the feminism that, that, that engendered rape shield laws, that means that, that, that a woman's history of making 11 previous false rape accusations is not admissible in court because it's part of her sexual history, right? Um, that's my feminism, because nobody even bothered, like, oh, I just thought it was a good idea at the time, and nobody bothered to tell me what the consequences of scope creep and, you know, judicial, you know, discretion might be, right? And all of these things, I I just didn't bother researching it, right? No, it's Mm -hmm. now that it's all about a fucking guy's shirt, right? And, And driving him to tears in front of an international audience, right? Now we finally decided that maybe things have gone too far. Like, that that's fucking retarded. I'm sorry. You know, if not all feminists are like the feminists who orchestrated all of this bullshit, right, all of the rest of the feminists are completely fucking ignorant. Completely yeah, uh, ignorant of exactly. what feminists have done, what they have brought about, right? And I'm sorry, that means that even though you're not like those feminists over there, I can't really admire you. Yeah. Uh, I just can't. Pretty much the major problem is that uh, they seem to have built up this view that feminism can't be criticized, and even the ones that are uh, liking feminism, they, they still are of this that can't be criticized. They lend a voice to the, oh, don't criticize me, and the, it pretty much comes off Bell. when they... When they say that uh, they they're not like those feminists over there, um, that's just lip service. Is all it is. If you're not actually taking firm action to condemn the behavior, really trying to get them held accountable, it doesn't matter at all. But they're not just not holding them accountable. These these feminists will claim that they're not like that and then go on to use the same buzzwords, the same biased yes. statistics, and the yes. same other propaganda that came from the feminists who are. And they'll use yes. those to promote hysteria in women and hatred of men and boys. And Precisely. obviously they are like that. And they, they, they can't even be taken seriously with that claim until they stop doing those things. Uh, that is very much so. something I'm wanting to bring up. Um, yes, anyway. Yeah. So, um, anyway, yeah, listen, I, guys, I got to take off. I have to go to work. It was very nice being on with you guys, and I will see you next time. Sorry. Okay, thanks for coming on, and have a good right. uh, New Year's Day. 
Yeah. All right. See you guys later. All right. Yep. Talk to you later. Um, I uh, I think that's uh, I'm getting the sense that uh, you're done, Green Knight. Is that correct? Uh, no. Um, I just kind of trying to make a point, and I keep getting uh, rants <laughs> start up. Sorry, anyway. Heather Karen. <laughs> yeah. All right. I'll try to. I'll I'll uh, I'll get the sensor duck ready. Make your point. Right. <laughs> uh, sensor duck. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. So the basic point is um, the Gamergate feminists, from what I've seen, I've seen some people that are very much uh, not not the typical social justice warrior feminists that you've seen around. They are actually using terms that are a lot more sympathetic to men's rights. Um, one I heard in one of Albert Campbell's streams that almost made me cheer, uh, the term exactly was patriarchy doesn't hurt men, sexism hurts men, and women can be sexist too. Oh, and, wow. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, pretty darn harsh against the typical social justice warrior bullshit. And so seeing that, it's made me finally see it's like, well, there actually are some that are going against the common rhetoric and these people need to be given a shout out, I'd say. Um, yeah. uh, there's uh, something that I saw, uh, um, anti-feminist-based uh, MRA type thing said that feminism needs to schism in order to be something anymore. Basically, we need it to be divided down and relegate these extremists off to the side where they belong and pretty much uh, that's what I'm thinking of going for with this program I was thinking of doing um, is to pretty much promote that exact schism by bring, holding up these examples of these people that are very much the diametric opposite, not like we're talking about the ones that will say, oh, I'm not like that, and then use the same buzzword. People that are really, really like Christina Hoff Summers that really get down and dirty and very critical. Well, one of the things that bothers me about that, though, is that um, if if you don't believe in a patriarchy that subjugates women and sometimes hurts men too, right? Then why are you calling yourself a feminist? I mean, that's like saying I don't believe Christ was the Son of God and I don't believe that He died for our sins, right? But I still call myself a Christian, Excellent right? That, point. That's really what it boils down to, and. You know, even just uh, like I don't, I don't understand if if you don't have an emotional attachment to the belief system underneath it, right? Which is yep. patriarchy theory and rape culture and all that other bullshit, right? Uh, female oppression, yep. uh, male okay. dominance, all of this other stuff, right? Um, male right. privilege. If you don't have an attachment to the, that set of beliefs, then why are you clinging to the label? Right, and, yeah, and I, I would I would actually encourage those particular uh, people who are expressing that it's not patriarchy that hurts men, sexism does, right? Mm -hmm. um, yep. To to just you know to just abandon just just get, abandon it's just a word at this yeah, point. Well, I agree. It's it's not a belief, but it's people are attached to it. That's the thing. PR. There are more people that would readily abandon the extremists and get off of that bandwagon if they thought there was an alternative that didn't require them to abandon feminism. I just happen to understand that about people. Uh, well, abandon the word your... feminism. That's the thing. They're not abandoning a belief system yeah, because they don't adhere to the belief system. If somebody is saying it's not patriarchy that hurts men, it's sexism, Right. Why do they need the label? Let's Why do you women. need the word? They're, they're not buying into the belief system of feminism. They they have nothing in common with someone who is a died in the feminist, right? Like they they don't believe in feminism, just like they don't, you know, that Chris that Christian self described Christian who doesn't believe Christ was the Son of God does not believe in the Christian faith, right? Why right. why would you call yourself? something that carries all of that baggage. Why would you do that? 
why are you so attached to the words? Like, I am willing to say that I come from a Christian background. Both of my parents were raised in Christian households, right? Um, my dad was very, very secular, and he was just like, uh, when he asked for my mother's hand in marriage um, of my gr- great-grandmother, uh, the matriarch of the family, uh, she finally went up to my mom and said, he says he will not join the church, marry him anyway, right? Um, um, so you know, like, here's the thing I'm getting from that there. Uh, you seem to be defining feminism according to this basis of the patriarchal oppression is the core belief structure of feminism, and if you don't believe that... It it really is. is. The Declaration of Sentiments. That Um, has been the core defining belief, is that the patriarchy oppresses women to men's benefit. That is... mm -hmm. It is a system designed by men to subordinate and oppress women for men's benefit. That that is, that is evident in every single bullet point. Okay, okay, all right, all right, Karen. Can, Karen, I, can right? I can I can I can I get an edit? No, you word can't. Because I think I no, 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 I think no, I no, understand no. what he's trying let, to get at. So yeah, but why don't you let him get at it? Go ahead, Green. Okay, fine. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so uh, that's a version of feminism that was pushed by like Gloria Steinem and these people that like you were talking about, seem to be extremely mentally disturbed. I've actually seen some videos. Gloria Steinem actually was raised by a single mother who was in and out of a sanatorium. She is literally mentally disturbed. Yeah. And that we actually bought into this is, oh, I can't even describe it. Anyway, so it was pushed by those people. I believe this was in existence before Gloria Steinem, but remember that it's Right now, you're basing on a current, oh, I forget the term. It's an actual uh, term that you are thinking of things as they are now and not seeing them as they were farther back. Farther back, there was a serious um, division in feminism. There was the egalitarian feminists versus these victim feminists and the egalitarian feminists saying that women need to be more... Uh, take responsibility, get the like men that you are strong versus the uh, What country are you brand. talking about here exactly? Because when we talk about feminism and when we talk about the time period, they're very, very important because there wasn't such a thing as feminism. There was things like women's solidarity and women trying to uh, fight for – you know, be women's advocates and things like that. That existed, but under the umbrella term of feminism, that didn't come on until later on. That didn't come well, until you had academic feminism with oh, people no, no, like no. Gloria Feminist, Steinem. Feminism was a term that was in use in the late 1800s and early 1900s, and there was uh, an an allowance. Uh, even e. e. Belfort Bax allowed that. Uh, that there were two types of feminists. One was the egalitarian feminists, and, and the other was the sentimental feminists, as he called them, right? Um, which would you would call the victim feminists. But the 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 dominant form of feminism, uh, right from the get-go, all through the suffrage movement, um, Emmeline Pankhurst, Christabel Pankhurst, all of those people, um, Susan B. Anthony, uh, the uh, the Declaration of Sentiments, as I said. It was all based on the idea that women were unjustly oppressed all through history by men as a class, right? That is what it was. 1848, Declaration of Sentiments, uh, he has arranged, mankind, uh, you know, the, the entirety of women's history is a list of grievances, right, uh, and usurpations by men, uh, you know, on the part of women, Right, like that, that men took this away from us unjustly. Men did this to us unjustly. Men did this, right? Mankind, man did this to women, right? That is the primary basis of, of all of feminism, any kind of feminism that has really gotten anything done. Um, you, can, you can make some claim that there were egalitarian feminists out there who got things done. Karen DeCrow, she actually managed to... Uh, basically, uh, she successfully defended a man from having to pay child support. Uh, she was the president, national president of the National Organization for Women, 
um, for two years, I think, she defended mm-hmm. a man from a child support case based on the fact that, that his claim was this woman knowingly entrapped him into getting her pregnant. She she lied about being on birth control. She said she was mm-hmm. on birth control. She got pregnant intentionally, and he should not have to pay for that, right? And she said men should not be... Re- if, if we are going to say that women are equal to men in every single way, men should not be forced to pay for women's unilateral decisions, right? Mm-hmm. And this was a unilateral decision on her part. She tricked him into participating in it, and he should not be held accountable. And she won that case. It was overturned on appeal, and he was made to pay, right? There are some people who have called themselves feminists, right, mm-hmm. who hold to an extremely egalitarian ethic, like I think Karen DeCrow has. And Kathy Young did a write-up of her just uh, just following her death earlier, I think, this year, um, from, I think, cancer. Mm-hmm. Um, All right. Basically saying she was not just a feminist, she was a men's rights activist. She was one of the first men's rights activists, right? Mm-hmm. And there have been women all through history. There were, there were women in the 19... There were female judges in the 1910s and 1920s, you know, long before the feminists of the 60s came along and granted women, one women, a, a right to education, right? Um, there were judges, female judges in the 1910s and 20s, arguing against alimony, they were arguing for alimony reform. They were arguing okay, against okay, Karen. breach of promise Karen. laws. They were arguing for all of these things, right? But, okay, but the basic premise of feminism, right? If you ask, if you if you line up a hundred feminists and say, do you believe in the patriarchy, and that the patriarchy is a system of oppression, right? Ninety nine of them will say yes. Okay, yeah. here's what I'm. Right now, the men's rights movement is gaining a lot of ground, and the feminist movement at this time also is incredibly suppressive to them. That's probably the main reason why it's not getting more positive coverage. Um, so the major goal here, get, get change the narrative, get the other side back, get the other side of feminism to uh, people will like it. It's just PR. It's just how the general public receives things. If you get the other side uh, talking again, um, I got to personally say one way or another, once they're given this good PR for the other side to come back, uh, if they manage to come up with some legitimate women's issues, they will take off. They will be a good thing. If they kind of don't have anything to go on, they will fall by the wayside either way. Um, I think both are great things to happen. They will run its natural course, feminism will, and at the same time, it will get people talking and paying more attention to men's rights issues. It will enter the public dialogue a little bit more by removing one of these obstructions and getting some assistance in removing these obstructions by changing the public narrative. Okay, um, I want to thank you, Green Knight, but we do have to move on because you. Um, yeah, sorry for you know, taking up so much college. of your time. I know no, it's don't been worry. going on a long. Great, some great points, some lots of discussion, things to think about, and uh, thank you again. A lot of that was me taking up time. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it always <laughs> is. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna go now to Kevin. Hi, Kevin. Hey. You've been waiting a long time, so go ahead. Take us where you want right. to go. For Kevin. So, um, have, um, has any of you um, read the HuffPost article about teaching, like, um, K-12 about consent? Uh, so that would be read? kids as young as five about consent. Oh, God. Yeah, yeah no, not. I haven't. I didn't read that article. I heard about it um, introducing sexual consent as as a topic in even elementary schools. Um, you know, honestly, what I have to say about that is, where did like you need to keep your hands to yourself? Like, where did that go? Right, because that's what I learned in kindergarten and and elementary school. I learned. Uh, yeah, no, don't put your hands on somebody, right, Um, unless 
they want you to. So, you know, like, don't hug somebody if they don't want you to. Don't, like, touch, poke somebody if they don't want you to. Like, keep your hands to yourself, right? No wrestling if if the other person doesn't seem interested, right? Like, none of that, right? Do you think... Where, where um... Do you think this is on um, um, a similar level to um, zero tolerance? Oh, it is. It is. It's, it's absolutely, you know, and I actually, I have a friend whose son has gotten suspended and sent home, and she was actually thinking of homeschooling him. And, and part of the reason was girls would actually, um, they – here here's the here's one one scenario that got him sent home from school at uh before noon one day um and he was i think he was in kindergarten at the time and they have those blunt scissors right not pointy right Mm -hmm. and she was like look look i you know i can i can like use these scissors on you and it won't even cut you and and she you know kind of put them on his forearm and she's like see Right, and then he was like, "Oh, well, let me try," and and he tried with her, and and no harm done, whatever. The teacher noticed and sent him home. So I've been um, uh, I had some experience with some, you know, tomboys, and mm. they um, usually don't mind some rough housing. Yeah. So um, I, um, it's kind of. Like uh, if the um, would the teacher be biased even if it's obvious that the girl pretty much um, yes you know just roughhousing basically and yes. they would judge that as you know yeah that's well if it's, if it's if it's a boy and a girl roughhousing and the girl gets hurt then the boy is going to be punished much more than if it happened the other way around and a boy and a girl are roughhousing and the boy gets hurt. Yeah, it's double standards. It's it's really sad yeah. to see what's happened to the educational system. Um I mean when it's like Karen said though, what did happen to, you know, keep your hands to yourself? I mean when when it came to things like consent and stuff like that, it was that, and also talking about strangers and uh, not to let people touch you and your private parts and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. What, it, it, in that age, at that age, that was that was the extent of of consent that they were, you know, willing to discuss. But it, I'm wondering if they're wanting to treat this as, you know, children being potential sexual predators to each other. That's- because that is exactly what they're trying to do. This is it's oh, not it's just about but, like, um, don't when, let this when, adult touch you on the parts of you that are covered by a bathing suit. No, it's don't you young men, you five year old boys, ever touch anyone in the part of their body that would be covered by a bathing suit. That's but what, um, wouldn't it be more um, effective if they teach? Um, well, especially girls, but uh, maybe teach both gender to. Um, you know, fight, fight back. Because I, because I had um, experience with um, some boys that um, would repeatedly poke. I mean, pretty hard pokes. So I would. Um, one time, I had to um, use physical threats to make them back off. But like, I got a warning. But I guess one, it, one I would have been. Yeah. One one thing that we had to do with my youngest was uh, was advise him because he had actually he was eight and he was big for an eight year old and he had a five year old boy in the neighborhood who would actually physically attack him and because this was a kid who was so much smaller than him and you know he'd been through the typical educational regime that you know you don't you don't hurt anybody especially someone who's smaller than you blah 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 right. Um, he, he had no idea how to respond to that, and, and we had to give him tips on how to um, how to not hurt the kid but make, uh, make the consequences of attacking him so unpleasant and uncomfortable that he just would stop doing it. And my boyfriend advised him that, okay, here's what you do when he comes at you and he wants to push you to the ground. You just hug him. You hug him and pull him into you, 
right, and hug him to you and then roll over on him and, like, and, and just really make it so that he feels like he can't get away for long enough that he just won't ever do that again, right? And you won't hurt him, right, but he won't like it. And, uh, and <laughs> me, my boyfriend told me if anybody ever throws, he showed me a move that if anybody ever throws a punch at you, um, here's how you deal with it. And I actually, uh, Nick Redding, who's about six foot two or something like that, and quite heavy, he was actually demonstrating how to throw a punch one day at, uh, at my work. He came, he came down to see me after work one day. And uh, so he's in the bar, and he's showing the bartender how to throw a punch, proper punch. And I pulled this move, and I actually had to catch him before I brained him on the bar. Right? I actually had to, you know, and this is just me just doing something that's essentially effortless. Right? <laughs> and uh, you, you, and it's not, it's not an aggressive move. It's, it's not even a defensive move. It's, uh, okay, I'm going to take you what you're doing and i'm just going to make it more so i'm going to step aside and make it more so pull you further in that direction and slam your head into the lockers or whatever right and that that is what i would like honestly that is what i would suggest to anybody <coughs> is being bullied and i would um, bend it they... three days. you really might okay karen karen sends <laughs> all right what did you have to say well um um well, it sounds pretty straightforward, but um, we can't really do that with um, uh, because this reminds me of that um, recent Miss USA self-defense controversy. Oh yeah, mm-hmm. where she said that women should carry guns or or take yeah. a self-defense course in order yeah, to I mean, like, like um, teaching us not to rape is pretty. I think mean, it's pretty nice, but what's what the girls, what is the girl going to do if it actually happens? So that's well, first of all, my... it doesn't do anything. Like, yeah, no, men the idea of race, teaching... they're not going to, they're not going to stop. The idea of teaching a man not to, or uh, anyone not to rape, uh, relies on the idea that normal people, um, who are healthy, functioning adults, right, will actually do that, and that that's just simply not how normal healthy functioning adults behave so and and when people are not normal and they're not healthy and they're dysfunctional uh they're kind of resistant to those kind of messages right so it, it really doesn't do any good to teach people not to rape i mean rape is is condemned uh you know socially and under the law and it has been on the decline for the last 30 years or so since the VCRs at least became uh, ubiquitous, right? And so, I mean, like, you're looking at, at a problem where pretty much everybody knows that it's it's not a good thing. Even rapists know that rape is wrong. If they didn't mm-hmm. know it was wrong, they wouldn't cover their tracks. They would not act in the shadows. They would not act in private. They would not try and figure out ways to get away with it. They know that it's wrong. They know it, even if they don't feel personally that it's wrong, they know that society thinks it's wrong, right? At least male yep. rapists. And so you, you look at that. How 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 is promoting the idea that rape is wrong over and above the all of the things in our culture that tell us that scream in you know and and that that blare it out in candy colored letters, rape is wrong. How 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 is that going to solve anything? Right, like the only thing that is actually going to, as as you as an individual who could be a victim of rape, the only thing that you the, can control is you, your decisions and what you do, what you're capable of, right? That is the only thing. Just like lightning strikes, right, and you as a golfer, right, have the choice to continue golfing in a thunderstorm or go to the freaking chalet and fucking start drinking instead, right? That That's your choice. You have those, you can't control where the lightning hits. You can't control, you have no control over whether the person that you're sitting across the room from at a party is a sexual predator or not. You have no control over them. You have no control over their behavior. You only have control over yourself, 
Right. Okay. And with that, and with that, Karen, Karen, Karen. Right, we have to we have to move on. Um, okay. We, do, we have some people. Uh, also, since we mentioned Nick, we uh, should uh, uh, plug his upcoming appearance. At when on when did you wake up? I have absolutely no details on this, so I can't tell you how to access this particular show. Oh, I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure it's on Saturday. Yeah, it's on Saturday. Uh, with Aaron Pizzi, Dean Central Esme. Time. Oh, and okay, I got you. With Aaron Pizzi and Dean Esme, it's they usually have a, a regular time on Saturdays, and I think it's 11 or something in the morning my time. Mm-hmm. Um, or 12 Central. They, so it would be on yes. live 365 uh, stations of Voice for Men. So yeah. uh, do do pick that up and watch Nick on that. And I want to thank uh, Kevin for calling in. Mm-hmm. And, no problem. And uh, we have some great topics. Um, I'm sorry to the guy who was waiting so long to come and actually talk to us. He disappeared just as he was about no. to. Yeah, I know, I know. And, um bad. So I'm going to bring on Sean, who wanted to talk about uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. So, Sean, you're on the air. Oh, cool. All right. Uh, hopefully this mic is okay. Yeah, it's fine. It sounds great. Yeah, it does. All right. <clears throat> okay. Hi, Del. Um, what am I calling you, Del, for? Hannah. Oh, she, I think she's gone now, right? Okay. Um, oh, yeah. I told, her, I, I told her this story already, so she knows. Do you all let you know? Um you know how back in the 60s, they made refrigerators so that they would, if a kid got inside, he couldn't get out because the handle was on the outside? Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. I, got in, I got in something like that when I was four. It wasn't a refrigerator. It was like a hallway, a uh, little utility closet, just big enough for shoes and boots or something, right? So yeah. it wasn't airtight or anything. It wasn't a question of suffocating. But try sitting in something that's about the size of a coffin, only shorter, and you got to squat down. Not be able to get out. Um, I had a good look at that, um, but I don't remember it. I don't remember it because I blocked it out. My uncle, my uncle told me what happened. He came home to our place. He couldn't find me anywhere, but saw my dad passing out on the couch. And my brother was watching the hockey game, eating chips. My mom was at the bingo. And he went around looking for me. And finally, he opened up this closet door. And this little kid comes running out with bloody fingers and pissy pajamas, screaming his head off. And there's blood all on the inside of the door, trying to claw my way out. And my fingertips are all ripped up. And I've had that ever since. You've had post-traumatic stress from that? Yeah, yeah. Major yeah, no, claustroph- I can, I can absolutely see that, and you probably have, uh, have claustrophobia as well, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. That didn't help much going through, through school because, pretty much, it, it was my entire life felt like walking along the edge of a swimming pool. At any given second, somebody could push me in. That's oh. exactly what every minute felt like. And so I, I basically, I, I would walk around with something sharp because I learned pretty quick that when, you know, when you stick people with stuff, they get off of you fast. Yeah. You know? It's yeah. not nice, but, you know, when, you, when you're drowning, nothing else matters. Yeah. You know? no, and that's I, exactly I, I, what it felt like. So um, I, I try to get help for this. Um, it was back in 92. Uh, I was living in Ottawa at the time, <clears throat> and I went to the ROH, and I told him, this is what I have. Can you help me? You know, And the guy was talking about some kind of therapy by uh, a, U- a UBC professor named Stanley Jack Rackman called uh, systematic desensitization, which is yeah. where you get slowly yeah. exposed to it, right? Yeah. I thought that'd be great. When can I start? And they never did. Oh they yeah, no. Because you don't you don't have the um you're not one of the not one of the that uh, that would qualify for that. Right? You're not one of the people that uh, that they would see as sympathetic enough. Uh you're not in other words, you're not a woman, you're not a war veteran, blah blah blah. So they wouldn't right. wouldn't bother doing it. One of the things that I can say though is that um the exposure therapy 
is is not something that you necessarily need to um, be enrolled in some kind of program to do. Um, can you can actually uh, take steps to like just with a fear of heights, right? If you have an, an irrational fear of heights, you can uh, you can get a step stool uh, for your kitchen and you can step on up onto that until your panic fades, right? And you can just keep sort of working up from there until your panic starts to go away, right? So whatever it is that is actually the trigger of your uh, your fear, which would I would guess would be in small enclosed spaces, you can you can maybe try and subject yourself to that and you know incrementally uh, you know close your bedroom door at first, right? You know if I'm I'm guessing you probably sleep with your bedroom door open. Um, no, it, it's not that bad. I mean, I've, I've actually done some sewer work where I've, I've I've faced my fear. I tried to get into it. It's when yeah. I actually can't get out and I have no control over that. That's when panic sets in pretty quick. But but it's funny you mentioned heights because with heights I got no problem. Um, mm -hmm. When I was when I was a kid, uh, I would climb trees, and when I ran out of that to get interested in, there there was a high rise building under construction in my backyard right well because, and it was, because you you showed you showed you had fear of enclosed spaces but being high up is the opposite of that being high up is is the opposite of being in an, in an enclosed confined space with a low ceiling right yeah, uh, yeah. It, it was also like the, the world's biggest jungle gym and i yeah. found that when you threw a cinder block from the 18th story roof um, it would take the sound about a second and a half to reach me. Oh. <laughs> it was it was really neat, <laughs> you know? and like there was a lot of stuff. Like it was it was just it was concrete and wires and and two by fours and ladders and a lot of sharp stuff because it was just under construction. The yeah, no, stuff, and, and the just... things that would maybe scare most people didn't scare you because you had this other thing that overwhelming overwhelmingly scares you. Oh but yeah, you were, uh, it made everything else me, really easy. Sean, you were Go talking ahead. to me about uh, something you read about uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome and why it wasn't working. I'm getting a lot of echo from you as well. So why? I've got a headset. I don't know why it would do oh, that. Uh, sure, I'm sure. That's hard. Yeah, but uh, you you were talking about how uh, you had found that the treatments for uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. The treatments for post-traumatic stress is, disorder weren't working. And you found something in Paul Elam's writings that sort of explained that. Yeah, uh, basically, you know, they they weren't working because, like you said, they weren't doing anything because I didn't qualify. I didn't have the X chromosome or whatever I'm supposed to have. Um, I, I went to Vancouver for a while, and all they wanted to do was give me either Paxil, Luvox, or something else. Basically, antidepressants. Just drug me. Oh. What the fuck? Didn't need that either. And then when it, when I finally read that article, I don't know which one it was that Paul wrote, it explained it. It's exactly like you said, Karen. They hate us. They don't care. Like we we don't really count to them. We're, we're not even it doesn't even matter. In fact, yeah, no, at one point you're not you're not at, supposed to be healed. One, you're just supposed to be treated and made functional, right? No, but, but it was worse. One of one of the uh, what the hell is his name? I don't know. What some shrink in in at UBC or whatever it was, he, he was giving me pills. I said, why don't you actually give me therapy instead of pills? What, what, are, you do, what are you Are you afraid I might get too brave or something? What is this? And he says, well, yeah, you know, if we take away your fear, uh, you know, you might be dangerous or something. Holy okay. fuck. Like, this That's is what, weird. This is what came out of his fucking mouth, you know? I mean, this, this guy is obviously a feminist. Anybody to say shit like that. I mean, yeah. I don't know what First off, that guy sounds incredibly unethical, but, you know, I, I don't think that it's just men who are facing some issues in terms of getting help. I, I think that oftentimes, especially when you're trying to do this on, on low income, they have a tendency to just want to do the quick and easy thing, which is to put you on a whole bunch of medications. I've been put on my fair share of medications and oftentimes you'll you'll see these issues that are so 
involved and so difficult to treat, instead of trying to bring you toward that kind of therapy, they'll just have you talk to them for a bit and then write your prescription. And yeah. Well, well, when I read what Paul wrote, which basically is how, how the entire health industry or health professions are, are taken over with this feminist agenda, well, no wonder they didn't care. They hate they hate my guts just for occupying space. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Well, I don't know that I don't know that they hate your guts. I think that I think that there's a, a lot of resentment in the health, the mental health profession for men who show up wanting help. Um, it, it's it's kind of like, why can't you just get over it and get back to work? Yeah, it's ridiculous. Wow. So well, I mean, like, I don't know that it's hate. Uh, it, it does, it's kind definitely of signal the lack of signal compassion. Well, what kind of disconnect can they have if I have exactly the same thing that they're treating a female patient for, and they know how debilitating it is for her? Yeah. I, don't, I don't know how to understand how they could think that I'm supposed to function just fine and dandy without the help she's getting. Yeah. No, I can't. I can't fault you for that. That calling that out. Um, it definitely is. Uh, it's a huge double standard. Um, I don't. I don't know that it's like that. That they hate you uh, for being a man. Um, it's. It's just that they. They don't care as much. They just don't. They don't care as much. Well, that would be a form, that, that would be a form of hate. Not caring about somebody is a pretty effective form of hate. I suppose. Well. I mean. I mean, they're not actively hating. They just casually that, couldn't care less. Yeah, okay, that's, well, that's, I, I'm sorry to interject, but we do uh, like we do have a few more items to get to before the end of the show, and we are getting towards the end of the show. So I want to thank you for bringing this up, Sean, and uh, thank you for coming okay. on and t- talking about your experiences. And I, I would agree that there is a lot of a- complete antipathy towards men. I don't know. I, I don't know. If I'm sort of in Karen's camp. But I'm not sure if it's hatred as it's just indifference which in some ways is a lot more toxic because hatred, you actually have an emotion. Indifference yeah. is just using people like a utility. But thanks again, yeah. Sean. At least, at least and, hatred can, can lead them to be accountable. Yeah. yeah. At least you can well, call them out. Well, at least you're on your on their radar. But, uh, yeah, well, thanks again for the call, and good luck with uh, with your post-traumatic stress syndrome. Um, okay. I, I, I think we might have a – let me just check – uh, we have a uh, just a second. Sorry, to do, 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 do. Um, see if we have anything in. Uh, you are. Oh, you don't. You are in Canada, right? Sorry, he was in Canada. He wasn't. Oh, Sean is in Canada. He's in Windsor, I believe. Yeah, I'm I'm a wizard. I thought you dropped the call already. Okay. No, Sorry. Um it looks like there's a there may be a, a mental health helpline. Um the number is one eight six six five three one six zero zero. That's one eight six six five three one two six zero zero. And uh there's also a distress center. Um I don't see one in uh, in uh, where you are at. But uh, perhaps that might be of assistance. Unfortunately, there's sure. perishingly little for men, so that's the best we can do. Yeah, and thanks again for your call. Um, hey, thanks. Okay, so we don't have any actual callers left. We just have emails and messages from people who would like to get this read on. Uh, first of all, we have a message from Nefenor, who actually is in the queue, but he said he's okay with listening. Pass along this. Rebuild initiative is also about reaching out to the developers and letting them know that we, as gamers, support them and want to show that we are the ones who are affected positively by their work. So that's uh, Nefenor's message about the the Rebuild initiative. And I, I, I think it's a great idea. I think uh, I'm always wanting to get something more positive out of these situations because you just can't constantly deal with the negative uh, you can't, it just, it, you'll kill yourself. So, mm. you know, building, creating, making something new, giving 
somebody telling somebody that they have had a positive impact on your life, these are important things to do too because we have to build as much as criticize. Um, and then also I got a message from, uh, uh, I'll call him CS. Hey, Badgers. I hope that the new year will be a good one. I do have a question for the New Year's open line. Totally round table and not necessarily directed to any participant in the, to the exclusion of others. If you get to it, fantastic. So it goes as follows. We are currently in a media and social landscape that is, by my view, fairly biased against men's equality and men's issues. There are a lot of knee-jerk vilifications of even the mention of a lot of these issues in the context of a genuine and pos positive exploration that touches on the masculine perspective. Linked to that, there seems to be a tremendous amount of bias in the media and politics that's not genuine, but rather seems to pander to the hyper-feminist narrative for dollars, viewership, clicks, etc., while at the same time being perhaps afraid to carry any narrative but the hyper-feminist one for fear of backlash, almost like having a tiger by the tail. You don't dare let it loose once you have caught it. So to each of you, in the context of how things seem to be going, what are your views and ideas on long-term strategies that may be necessary to bring discussion of men's rights and issues out of the fringe, gain traction in mainstream media, and generate more positive dialogue that may create fruitful end games that align with your viewpoints? I apologize if that was a mouthful. Have a great evening from the frozen wastelands of Edmonton, Alberta. All righty. So let's let's do that as a round table. Does anybody want to start? Anybody? Bueller? Rachel. <laughs> ah, whatever. Ah, okay, okay. How how do we expand? Um, how do we I mean, how do we deal with the fact that there's so much feminist censorship in the mainstream media and how we get the word out about men's issues? Huh. Well, to to be honest, what we need to do is what we have been continuing we uh, have been doing so far, which has been to target the kinds of people who are interested in, you know, freedom of speech, the people who are of the mind that you shouldn't censor free speech and, you know, keep going. Those are the people who tend to decide with us because they understand that even though they may not necessarily agree with us, they still understand that freedom of speech is valuable and that you need a free flowing of ideas to create a better society. But if we want to if we want to expand what we're doing right now, maybe it we need it I don't know. It's it's tough. It really is tough. To, with with, with it's me, hard to prove. It, it, it it's really it's really difficult to prove because even if you have all of these facts and you lay them out for these people, if they are coming from an ideological mindset, it's very difficult to tell somebody that they've been lied to for this long. Well, one one of the really scary things uh, is that um, a lot of the most reasonable rhetoric, right, the most reasonable analysis of things like Gamergate, things, uh, you know, just various things, right, has been coming out of uh, places like Breitbart, places like, um, you know, I, Fox News. Fox News interviewed Dr. Helen Smith and, you know, and Tucker Carlson said some really freaking asinine things and Helen Smith gave him that look like, what are you fucking crazy, right? But they are willing to actually engage uh, contrary ideas. And this is what I have found uh, consistently is that, um, that the only people who are not sort of male issue centered uh, like Cafe or Kasem, right, who have asked me to speak, have been uh, either libertarian uh, political groups or uh, very, very sort of alternate right, alternative right wing, right? And they are extremely, like they were extremely open-minded. I sat uh, at dinner at a conference in Edmonton with the person who founded the Wild Rose Party in Alberta, which is an, an extremely libertarian uh, sort of alternative right-wing party here in this province, um, and a very quite successful one. And he was extremely interested in everything that I had to say, right? And, you know, it was, he just, he, like, there was none of that, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but, that I get from the left, right, like that I got from David Pakman when I did an interview on his show, right? 
Um, those people, because they are now uh, the political underdogs, right? Uh, even Fox News is really a political underdog across a lot of the U.S. Um, they value freedom of expression because they know what it would mean to lose it, right? Um, the left has long forgotten what it would mean to lose the the freedom of freedom of speech and freedom of expression, right? They've they've completely forgotten about the movement in the 60s and the 70s for free speech on campus that was led by left-wing students, right? They've forgotten that they how hard they had to fight for that, right? And so yeah, I think basically and and one of the really nice things about about having to deal with the political right because they're the only ones who are even willing to air these these issues out in public and actually speak to them. Right? One of the really nice things about having to deal with the political right is it actually allows because the men's rights movement and uh the sort of the modern progressive anti-feminist movement, the 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 anti-feminism that that represents me, right? is not one that opposes gay marriage. It's not one that opposes gay adoption. It's not one that opposes any of that stuff. It's not one that embraces traditionalism. It's not one that does any of those things. So having to deal through the right wing um, in order to actually get these views into sort of a mainstream uh, audience, it actually impacts how those right wing people view these other issues such as gay marriage, you know, gay adoption, all of those things, right? Um, they're, they're basically sort of saying, well, these people, I, I maybe don't agree with them on those things, but they're not all bad, um, and I'm going to give them a fair hearing, right? And, and so I think that, that we, have, we have a huge opportunity um, to uh, not just oppose the the establishment feminism that seems to be calling all of the shots in left-wing media, but we actually have uh, an opportunity to temper some of the hard lines of the right-wing media a little bit. Um, Milo Yiannopoulos uh, has, has demonstrated this quite well as far as just being very, very sympathetic to to men's position right now and, and looking at it in the sense that, yeah, traditionalism wasn't a cakewalk for men, right? It, it just wasn't. It never has been. Okay. So. Um, I'm going to just uh, pop back in. Um, huh? We do have one final question. Uh, actually, you know what? I'm going to pull him on to to say his final question. And if, if that's it for the night. Okay. I don't know if you want me to use your name, so I won't. I'm Steve Thompson. <laughs> okay. Steve Thompson, go ahead and say your question. Uh, hello, Honey Badgers. Hi. Uh, and I'm fairly new to this uh, MRA and MGTOW stuff. For the last couple of months, I've been reading on the Internet, looking at YouTube, going to this site and that. And uh, there are... It's educational for me. I'm discovering many things that I did not know, and there's a great many things on particularly Karen Strawn's YouTube videos with which I can identify. Karen Strawn, kudos, congratulations, smile, and feel pleased. You make good sense. Thank you. Uh, But in all, what I'm impressed with is the amount of uh, often bitterness between the various sides on this plan. Uh, on on the subject of feminism or MRA, men's men's rights in general, because there is such business uh, bitterness and such acrimony between the two sides, is there anybody trying to work on a vocabulary where discussion is possible? Obviously, a rapprochement between the sides would be best. I mean, if there is no rapprochement, then things continue on as they are, which I regard as tolerable. And short of picking up a rifle, then you can't solve the problem. My question is, has anybody got a vocabulary? Is anyone working on a specific set of arguments? Is there some common language being formulated 
or at least forums being sought, where the two sides can talk in civil fashion. Um, well, I, I think I that that's... Actually, Karen, Karen, can I take this one? Yes, well, you can. Uh, you can go first, and I'll come um, after. <laughs> Just as long you as you come in the minutes. end. Eh? All right. Well, I think I've been trying to create a common language with my work into um, the the psychological typecasting and its effect on women and pre- explaining that reducing women down to victims in every conceivable circumstance is in of itself a form of disenfranchisement. Um, and encouraging women to do this it can in and of itself explain a lot of the differential in STEM fields and 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 women's motivation to do these things. And even if it can't explain it all, some of it is biological, that most likely it doesn't help. And um, it, it and so I've been trying to create that kind of a common language um, to explain how men's issues actually are also in a way women's issues as well. I mean, as we marginalize male victims by stampeding to to shove women up in the limelight as the greatest victims ever that ever did ever did victim um you know at both uh, it, it hurts both men and women men's issues are marginalized and women's issues are overblown to the point where they become a problem in and of themselves the media attention to that the the constant drumbeat of victimization becomes a problem in and of itself so i would say that i'm trying to create like a at least a uh, I, I sh- trying to illustrate that this is a dynamic. It's not a one-sided issue. It's a two-sided issue. It's a dynamic. You do something to men, you do it to women. Um, I, what I have found is that men's rights activists almost unilaterally like my work, and feminists almost unilaterally hate my guts. So well, be that way. That, once again, the line is in place, and uh, what you. And I, I've seen your cartoons and your explanations uh, in the miniature videos, and I've even been, I'm afraid I've forgotten the name of it now, you have a site where there's a cartoon. I don't clearly understand all of those, the lessons that you are attempting to teach, but I can see that that is a medium that does, in fact, teach roles, psychological attitudes, and so on. When you say that feminists almost universally recoil from the exposure, and people of the MRA mind find it to be interesting, then we still have a line somewhere. And I well, we do. We do. And here, but here's here's one of the things that I think separates MRAs from feminists, and um, at least uh, MRAs like myself from feminists. I can't speak for every MRA uh, by any means, but uh, but generally, what I have seen is that uh, when when it comes to my YouTube channel, my blog, uh, the men's rights subreddit on Reddit, uh, multiple uh, sort of forums uh, where men's rights activists talk about stuff, right? there, there tend to be very few controls as to who can speak um, and what they're allowed to say. And, uh, like, I have... Uh, I've, blocked about a handful of individuals, about five, six maybe individuals from my YouTube channel uh, since I started it, and three of them were one guy who kept posting, you know, burn all the feminists and the Jews, and then when I blocked him the first time, he came back and said, you can't stop me, burn all the feminists and the Jews, and then I blocked him again, and then he came back with another alt account, right? Well, um, on, on my side, I'm 64 years old, and I know what an annoying drunk is. Yes. Yeah. Well, but whatever. I mean, like this wasn't just an annoying drunk. He was. He was. He was. Uh, I, I went and I looked at his feed, and and he was quite really, really. He was. He was really, really. Uh, he he incited violence a lot, and I didn't want him on my channel inciting violence. Right. Yeah. And gotcha. but other than that, you can pretty much say what you want to say on my channel, on on in my on my channel comments, on any of my video comments. I don't really, I don't moderate them at all. I don't, I don't moderate discussion there. Blah blah blah. Anybody can say whatever the fuck they want. And Karen, you don't, I, I you do be, not find that. I hate to be the one to do this. I hate to yeah, you do not want, clear. you do not find that in right. feminist can space. Can I break in? At I all. think I have an yeah, answer. Okay. I think I have an answer then to my very quickly, to my puzzle. very quickly. 
And it's quite simply this. What we have is conversations. Feminists on one side, MRAs on another. And we just have to keep the conversation going. Well, we don't. We don't have a conversation between feminists and MRAs. Feminists have a monologue and MRAs have a conversation. That that's what's going on. At some point, we got to get we got the conversation has to be bidirectional, and um, I guess the well, thing the to do is, is just keep pro- talking on an individual basis. The problem with the making it bidirectional, and this is the problem that I've had with with talking to feminists, is that they will not concede anything, even if you frame it in terms of this is how the situation hurts women. If you care about women, you should care about this. They still do not respond oh, I- to that. I've, I've heard it and I believe it, and I think I've encountered it personally. They uh, are yeah, they, totally they, wedded they, to well, the idea. I'm not trying to be dismissive son. here, but when you have someone who's convinced that, I don't know, mint tea will turn your eyelids green or something, it's very difficult even if you sit in front of him and drink a cup of mint tea and have him say, Look at me now. Uh, beliefs yeah. are, are yeah. difficult things. I'm doing a lot of reading in psychology now as well. Uh, but I, I, hate I, to, I hate to interrupt you. Um, yeah. I'm gonna have to. This is I'm like we have almost no time left. So. Yeah, actually, you have three minutes left according to the screen. Yeah, I well, have some stuff to do before we we go out. So I'm gonna thank you for for go, coming on, um, and uh, I'm gonna thank my hosts for for taking part. And we're gonna be skidding in right under the hour. The episode will end. <laughs> we'll be forced to end. So uh, Karen, you can't say anything more. Um, oh, whatever. Okay, well, that's oh, wait, it. That's I just all these... said something. Yes, oh, my okay, goodness. no more, no more. All right. I wanted to thank everybody who's helped make this episode possible, Ka- uh, Karen, Hannah, Rachel, Anna, who never got to speak because her phone kept cutting in and out. And uh, I also want to thank, again, our patrons, um, who we have a great, great group of patrons. we got a great group of listeners. They're very generous. We have a very generous group of listeners. Lots of them choose to become patrons. And if you if you haven't chose to become a patron and help us out, please do consider that if you are financially able to, because we really cannot do this without you. Um, I, I can't emphasize this enough. It's not possible for us to do this without our patrons, without the people who help us out um, financially. And uh, the reality is that the wolf in this particular fight that will win is the one that you feed. And um, And once again... Everything helps. Every little bit helps. If you can only afford um, 50 cents an episode for, I don't know, two episodes a month, that's – I'm not going to turn my nose up at it. Every little bit helps. Um, and it, it helps really to know that you care enough about this message to actually help us increase its scope and increase the amount that we can put into it. Um, once again, our next funding goal is 350 an episode, and once we hit that, we will be putting on more of these call-in shows. Um, and uh, yeah, just thank you to the very generous listeners who have already become patrons. Like I said, we have a great group of listeners. They're very generous people, and we really appreciate it. And um, have a great New Year's Day, and have a great year. Um, I think I think it's you know I think everything is 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 coming up roses so i think it's going to be a better year uh, i think we're going to be better as a species and and we're going to just just we're going to we're going to ace this at some point i think i i, I don't unrelenting optimism but it, it's what i do and uh so good night from honey badger radio uh good night from sensor duck oh, oh i will kill that duck yeah yeah i, I figured you would you would chime in and, I will uh, yeah. fucking kill that duck. Oh, oh well, you know, I you, I had the positive, and you have to bring in the negative. That's me. It's just yep. who I am. <laughs> I would love you for it, Karen. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Good night, Good everybody. Night. Good night, and thank you. <laughs>